Okay. <laughs> Dan is recording already. Let's let's make it official. Um, greetings, I everyone. Go ahead. Somebody had a comment. Oh, I, I just kicked on the recording. Go ahead. Sorry. Oh, just kicked it on. <laughs> just, just me. <clears throat> well, greetings, everybody. Um, welcome to our Saturday Zoom sessions. I can't believe, but this is number 20. We've been going for, for quite a while, and we've had some very interesting and knowledgeable callers around the world do presentations or that short presentations that lead us into very interesting discussions that go for a little over an hour and then the real interesting conversations start after that. Dan's learned to keep the recording on. Um, I'm Don Beck in Massachusetts who's been doing the emceeing and, and finding people to talk. Dan Lake is the my cohort in crime here um, who's been doing the, the engineering, the technical stuff and uploading most of them, all but the first few. So we can look at them later and so can others. Um, and as I say, we've had some very interesting things, but occasionally we've hogged the mic and done presentations and discussion leaders ourselves. And that's what we're going to do this week. Um, I see some faces that haven't been with us before and want to welcome those guys. Um, Dan, this may be turning into an interesting thing because I see more, I, I do see some of the newer people you want to talk to, but I see a lot of experienced callers here too. And I'm going to try and keep my mouth shut to listen to the, to the less experienced callers and to see what kind of stuff they need us to, what kind of stuff they need we experienced callers to listen to and be able to translate better. Or I don't want to use the word dumb down or anything. But anyway, without further ado, a man of many talents, one of those including square dancing and thinking about it and talking about it. Let me pass the mic over to, to Dan Like. Thank you, Don. So when we started talking about this, well, I mean, it was kind of, when I first uh, said, heck, I'm going to pay 15 bucks a month and we're going to have a conversation here. One of the things that I found in my learning to call was that there was an awful lot of stuff where the experienced callers had the mental ability to see things that the new callers didn't. And so this fantastically talented caller coach would be trying to teach me something and I just could not absorb it. And one of the other challenges I have is that I realized, and I'll tell you this, the specific instance in just a moment, that I have gotten to the other side of that. And there are a lot of places where I now have the mental ability to not get there. I started dancing in 2012. I called my first tip in early 2014 because I'm the sort of person that people say, hey, we can't find a caller for this demo square. Can you do this? And boy, that was a disaster. I went to um, Tom Miller's uh, caller school in the summer of 94. And by the fall of 95, uh, a local caller called me up and said, hey, I got to give up a club. Do you want to take it over, get a month or two of dancing out of it before it totally disappears? And that was five years ago. And by the time COVID hit, it was still growing. But with that club, it took me a full six months of calling for them before I had my first night of coming home and saying, oh, that's what it's supposed to feel like. And it was another month or so after that where one of the dancers came up to me and said, thank God you finally figured it out. So <laughs> the, um, <coughs> the, the learning curve has been, has been steep. I've, been, I've come up through it quickly. And I wanted to, to run through a couple of places where now I see what the problem was and I would have gone through it or you know done it totally differently but at the time even though I had some really smart people around me they couldn't help me and then what I'd really like to do is turn this over to the other newer callers because as I said I'm getting to the point where I'm not a new newbie anymore so let's start with that first one here let me share screen <clears throat> Uh, Firefox Taminations. There we go. Okay. So, uh, 
first caller school we go to is uh, Tom Miller and in 94 in Salt Lake City. And I, I am looking for new modern music. So I get Jerry Story's uh, version of ESP 182. She got, or not that one, sorry. Jerry Story's version of Gramophone 809. I don't feel like dancing. If you do not know this, it's uh, kind of a, uh, a neo-disco piece by the Scissor Sisters from the mid 2000s. And the, so, I carefully sat through this and memorized the entire figure. And this is absolutely not a figure that new callers should be calling, but I really liked the song and I thought I could sell it. So it was heads box the net and then square through two, put centers in, cast off three quarters round, centers wheel around, everybody wheel around, star through, dive through, and the centers square through three three hands round, and then here's the part, left hand box the net, you courtesy turn and promenade, go walking around like that. Couple things about this. Uh, first off, this is not something that a new caller should call to a, a floor cold. If you, have, if you are a new dancer working through something, um, please pick a, pick a song with a simpler figure that you can emulate. But I saw, did you know, a couple run throughs on this, saw how difficult it was and started talking to experienced people, experienced square dancers and callers about how to simplify it. And you know, some of the things we had were rather than this wheel around and wheel around, which requires some really precise timing, <clears throat> I changed that to center's partner trade, everybody partner trade, and that upped the success rate just a little bit. But that left hand box the net, courtesy turn and promenade, go walking around like that. Talked to a bunch of people and not a one person said to me, hey, you know, at that point, they're standing in a corner box. You can call swing and promenade and not confuse a whole lot of dancers. The next year, I went to caller school with uh, Scott Byers and Ken Rattucci and Rob French, and uh, ended up with uh, Elmer Sheffield's uh, She Got the Rhythm, I Got the Blues. And so we, I don't have the stars in here, another issue, but it was, you know, head square through, four hands around now. With the side, you make a right hand star, head star left inside that old ring now. Same to do right, ah, go back. Same to do right and left through. And once again, this whole touch a quarter, scoop back, boys run pass through thing was way too complex for the floors, the caller school checkers I was dancing for, calling for. And Scott said, well, why don't you just do a star through slide through? And again, it was one of those things where I was just blown away that somebody could see that in their head without a sequencer. So another place where this came up was I was, um, <clears throat> let me stop sharing for a moment. I was in, uh, we have a fantastic callers workshop down in the South Bay. Rich Real put it together. And it's basically dancers or uh, new callers calling to each other, whatever they want to call. Um, Rich kind of mentors it, but mostly just steps out and only pops in if somebody says, please help. And he really encourages that people just start by calling circle left, Alamand left, right and left grand until they get that rhythm down. Um, but it was late in the afternoon, my blood sugar was low and I was trying for a particular get out that had everybody paired and I had everybody with the right hand lady. Okay. There's a, a male centric view of the, of the choreography. And I simply could not get people separated again because it was like I was calling, 
I was calling until I saw a figure that kind of worked for me and I hadn't yet gotten the notion of bringing one person or two people across. And eventually Rich said, if you want that, you can call just end circulate and aha, the light bulb went off and everything, everything made sense. So I guess, and uh, similarly, I was somewhere around that same time period, within a year or two after my first getting that club, I was talking with Bob Elling of Riverboat Records and talking about my challenges with trying to understand something. And he just was like, oh yeah, you do this or this or this. And I completely could not understand, I had no, no framework for understanding the choreography. Nothing, nothing worked. So I guess what I'm trying to get is to, to get the newer dancers or newer callers who sign into this, who, who are here, to talk a little bit about where have you had problems in, in getting, uh, in understanding what the experienced callers are talking to you about. Because I just gave you a couple of examples of places where, to me now, you know, if I see, um, oops, if I see this formation, I completely know that I'm a right and left through equivalent away from a swing and promenade and this touch a quarter, scoot back, boys run, pass through, is that You're not, sh you're not sharing your screen, Dan. Oh, so don't know shoot. What you're looking at. Thank you. And of course, I stopped the recording and restarted the recording, so I'm going to have to merge those somehow afterwards. Uh, I'm not confident. Talks a lot better when we can see the pictures. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> What what is going on here? How? Oh. Well, that's the bad way of doing it. Um, no, not that. Heck! Son of a poodle. There we go. Um, no. No. So. Uh, am I, no, I'm not squaring, sharing now. Ah, completely. This is a newbie presenter, a newbie presenters class. Is it? Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, I'm not seeing, oh, this. Is that sharing or showing? Yes. Okay, good. So, um, so yeah, I, what I, what I wanted to kind of get conversation going on was that whether it was things, especially in terms of choreography, I ended up with these, with repeating these, these things that I heard on the, on the recordings and not even when I worked through them with checkers, I didn't really have the mental framework or structure to get it. And so whenever I talked with experienced callers about it, they'd say, oh yeah, that's just a right and left through equivalent. And I was completely lost. And so I'm kind of hoping that I can get some input and some conversation from the newbie callers because I'm not a newbie caller anymore. I realized that a couple of years ago, uh, we started something at the IAG STC convention called Zombie Callers a bunch of us newer callers uh, hadn't heard each other call and I didn't go to caller school that year. And so we let ourselves into a, a hall late at night and called to each other until we were absolutely bleary eyed. And this was so popular, it, be, it became part of the regular schedule. And last year, I'm the organizer of it. I got up and called a tip and realized, no, this, this isn't for me anymore. I'm just taking up space where the actual new callers can can be there. So, so yeah, newer callers, <laughs> step up and expose yourself. Um, <laughs> where, when, where do you have situations where when the, 
the experienced callers talk to you, you go, what? There's got to be somebody out there who's, who's got that. Sure. I'll, I'll Bring bite. It um, I'm, I think there's a decent chance that I'm both the youngest person here and the newest person here, maybe. I've been calling for about two years at this point. Um, and uh, I, I was excited by this topic, so uh, I brought notes. Um, <laughs> um, okay, so I guess I'll, I'll sort of start with my sort of background, which was I got pulled into an amateur night that my local club ran, um, for which I prepared a patter tip using cards and a singing call. Um, and then from there, I, um, I went to my first caller school. And, um, you know, because I was in a beginner, I was with the group that was like, you know, all right, you know, here, you know, here's your, you know, let's start on basic things like diction and timing and all that. Now let's move into the chicken plucker and start talking about modules and build things up that way. And I was just not getting it at all. This made no sense to me. Um, so at the end of the day, one of the caller coaches comes over to me and is like, you know, tonight you we're not going to talk about this but you should go read about the two-face line site resolution method and i did and i learned it and it was like oh okay this is intuitive to me i get this um and so when i was starting out I mean, when I was starting out, I was doing a lot of calling off of cards, especially since most of my opportunities to call were for advanced and challenge. But whenever I had the opportunity to do extemporaneous mainstream or plus calling, like my, my, my approach to it was try to keep people moving, doing whatever, and then, you know, use this somewhat strict method to resolve. Um, and, you know, I couldn't, at the time, I couldn't necessarily explain what each step of the method was doing in terms of phaser or what, you know, what it was accomplishing in a way that, you know, I could incorporate advice from other people. I also didn't necessarily like the, when, when the, the exercises that always gave me the most trouble were like, you know, when I went to a subsequent caller school would be like, all right, you know, you've got a corner box, let's get a partner line. Um, and I was like, you know, that's, that's outside of the little framework that I've built for myself. I need to expand my framework to get there or start over with a completely new framework but I'm not quite there yet. Um, and so in terms of, you know, how do you, how do you, how do you teach around that? Um, I think there are, there are a few key things for me that I would have found helpful earlier on. Um, a big one is when experienced callers are talking about choreography to newbies, try to be clear what your methodology or mental model is as much as possible. I had some experience talking to a local caller and we kept talking past each other until I realized, oh, his fundamental model that he uses for calling is a mental image variant. He doesn't care about a lot of the things that I care about. And I don't, you know, I don't get to, um, you know, and I don't necessarily need to worry about some of the things that he's worried about. Um, and similarly, you know, if you're talking and you assume that like the newer caller is working off of the chicken blucker framework or whatever, and they're not doing that, um, some, some things which make a whole lot of sense within that framework are just like, what, but why would you want to do that? I don't understand and just get hung up there. Um, so I think as sort of like clarity about, you know, what your, what, what mental model you're thinking of targeting is important. Um, another, another skill that I feel that it appeared to me like 
every, you know, all the experienced callers had that I didn't have at all was advanced planning. So, you know, starting out, but I, don't have I, I could get about one or two calls ahead. Like I could be like, all right, you know, I want to perform a particular manipulation. I can, you know, I've got one or two calls maybe to do like, I, I can I can think I, I can visualize how to do that if it only takes one or two calls to do that transformation. So um, for instance, like if you take something like the standard magic module that you would teach in a caller school, that's what, five calls? Um, that was just, you know, that was totally beyond me. Hey, I could. Jamie, this is Larry Marquise. Uh, just trying to reach you this morning. Um, I could move. I could move. A, I could move away from where I was, and then move towards a destination. But I couldn't move directly from where I was to the destination. Um, and. I think that a lot of callers have internalized these, you know, smaller building blocks and then can assemble them into larger building blocks sort of on the fly. Um, so one of the things that struck me at the, uh, the first zombie callers, first or second zombie callers was we had, uh, had a new, uh, a dance a caller who had been through the caller school I went to and at least two subsequent ones. And like in the chicken plucker, we were showing her the motion. And I said, well, you know, it's just the same as center's partner trade centers pass through. And that absolutely blew her mind because in the whole three years of caller schools that she'd been going to and whatever practice her clubs had been giving her, nobody had ever showed her that you know, it, it, it was always the right and left through pass through trade by, not that simpler motion. So anyway, back over to you and. Yeah. Um, well, I don't know. I've also talked a lot. So if uh, someone else. Okay. Has things to share, but. Um... I find okay. my biggest problem with calling is um, talking to callers. They seem to have all the calls at the tip of their tip of their tongue. They can just lay out what the next call should be. And my biggest problem, I think, is spontaneity. I, I don't have the ability to to think fast enough to get to the next call. My checkers don't have any problem waiting around for me to think about what to do <laughs> next. But the dancers don't want to – they aren't checkers. They want to move. And my problem is I'm just not – I'm just not up to the speed where I can just, you know, get the calls out and flow. And I'm sure that's got to do with steps two, four, six, eight, nine, and ten. But that's uh, that, that's that's probably my one of my biggest bugaboos is um, you know the spontaneity of being being able to just leap up there with the next call. John is a uh, as an advanced and challenge somebody who started an advanced and challenge calling. You want to speak to the. Uh, the strength of working off written material sure yeah and i and i think i think it it also circles around to a more general point of you know caller schools as far as i've experienced them tend to have a very standardized curriculum um and some of you know curriculum standardization helps because people get good at teaching it um but i think there's also a lot of value in preparing an experience for dancers that draws mostly on your strengths and allows you to work on a couple of your weaknesses sort of in isolation. And so for me, like starting with written material was great because, um, you know, all of the choreography could go out of my mind and when I was calling and I could work on things like timing watching the dancers um, and improve those so that once, you know, then once those are solid, you can shift into extemporaneous choreography and then sort of all you have to worry about is call recall. Um, but I will, I will, I am also so guilty of, you know, attempting 
attempting to do something, realizing I've missed, and just be like, okay, we are just going to call things. I don't know what they do. Um, but, you know, I just, I just need a few seconds to breathe. And then, and then we will try again. Um, so I guess, yeah, I, I guess, I guess, so I guess, uh, yeah. And, and I, I think writing has given me some sense of nice combinations to fill time with. Yeah, I, I think that there's, when I, uh, it's, I remember, I, the gay square dance community provides wonderful opportunities for newer callers to learn. And uh, one of those has been that at the uh, IAG SDC convention, they have top of the hour. Uh, while the, the new, next caller gets ready, you get a tip. And a couple of years ago in Palm Springs, I was calling a head of Hunter Keller. And, you know, I fumbled my way through my tip. And then I watched Hunter just stand up and call off the top. And it was like, yes, I want to do that, but there's no reason not to read as if as long as you can deliver that with good with good timing. And I think that we don't give the new callers nearly enough opportunity because we focus because we don't focus on choreography when we're teaching. We don't give the new callers nearly enough opportunity to say, no, I'm just going to read my chicken plucker. Janet, you want to pipe in? I, I do. I have several things. Um, that I have experienced throughout my learning to call. Um, and that is that a lot of times the callers that are doing the teaching or the experienced callers, I think they have forgotten sometimes what it's like being a new caller and they kind of talk above your head. A couple instances were um, at the very beginning, I had no idea what a corner box was or what a module was, but the person doing the teaching expected everybody in the class to know those terminologies and what they did, and half of us did not. Another one was arrangements. They were talking about arrangements and not a single person in that room knew anything about arrangements. But the problem was they didn't allow for questioning. They just kept plowing forward and did not allow time for that question and answer session. And then another thing is they will run through a, a sequence and then say, well, you know where they are, right? Uh, no, we're just learning this stuff. You need to walk us through step by step. We need to get out our checkers and walk through what you just said. And then we can try and figure out where it is that we are. Don't expect us to know it off the top of my head. Another thing is um, when it comes to the caller schools, I've been to many, many caller schools, uh, different types of caller schools also. And I think maybe some revamping might be in order because there is never any prep material given out, even though I have sometimes requested it. And I think um, documentation as to these are the terminologies you need to be familiar with. If you're not, here's the place to go to look and get that information, but to have some prep material before you arrive um, because the very first school I went to, I called them and I said, what do I need to know to attend? I know nothing. I mean, literally nothing. I'm a dancer. That's it. And they said, oh, well, we like you green. And I said, oh, good. That's me. I know nothing. And then he says, but if you could have a singing call prepared. And I'm like, say what? Yes. And I think that one of the problems with uh, the, with kind of the other material is that every caller has their one true way of understanding the material. Um, to John's point about the two-faced line get outs, uh, the number of times I've had the, uh, I've been to three caller schools now, I guess, but the first two, um, everybody was talking about the facing, doing a facing line get out. And clearly those callers who were teaching this could think about how to get people into facing lines, but I kept calling bend the line where flow was absolutely awful to get them into those two-phase lines or to get them into those facing lines. Whereas the two-phase line thing, yeah, works perfectly because I don't have to bend the line. Hello. 
sitting here taking all of this in, uh, I passed on quite a few comments that I probably should have made. Uh, first, earlier somebody said, uh, how do you do this, uh, blah, blah, blah. One thing I love to say at a caller school, callers call. The more you call, the easier it's going to get. Now, if you have no opportunity to call, chances are you're never going to become a caller. You have to have dancers out in front of you. Now, you can learn a lot just from calling to two couples. But till you've got a square in front of you and you're calling on a fairly regular basis, you're not going to learn it. Uh, I don't care how bright you are. Now, I've never... Uh, to my knowledge, had anybody in one of my caller schools that was just starting out calling advanced and challenge. Uh, that's got to be quite different. Uh, and I, it just didn't uh, occur to me that uh, some of the same problems that a brand new caller would have probably would apply to uh, somebody starting out in the advanced and challenge as well. So I'm going to give some thought to that. Uh, college schools. The things that you're talking about, you should go to college school to learn. Uh, there's two things you're going to be concerned with uh, out of a college school. One is how to call, the other is what to call. Now the how to call, that takes in all of the, uh, well, delivery type of stuff, the singing, the, the, you know, the pretty stuff. The mechanical stuff, your, your timing, your uh, phaser, if you like, uh, your arrangements, uh, your formations, all of those kind of things, they should be explained in that school. Now, I would like to think that uh, any call lab accredited school should go through that material. And if they don't, something should be said to call a lab about it because that's why they have that accreditation. It's because these fellows and gals that have that accreditation are supposed to know enough to teach those things to a brand new caller. At least give you enough information that you can work it up from there. Uh, I always like to say that calling is, easy, uh, is simple, but it's not easy. The things that you're talking about mostly are very, very simple, but they're only easy after you do them and do them and do them, study them, study them, study them. Um, so, you know, one of the things I think that I, I experience with the Caller Lab coaches is my, my best learning experiences have not come from Caller Lab accredited caller coaches. Um, in fact, I would kind of recommend that you not worry too much about the the caller schools generally um, because there is too much forced into them and it's just overwhelmed and washed over. And part of the reason I mentioned uh, reading for John was the thing that got me through the first six months or so of calling for a club was putting out a, a three page wide, uh, I built a couple of them, get ins, uh, zeros and get outs that I could lay across the table in front of me and read the material for. And nobody, nobody kind of gave me that organization during the caller schools because that that's not how the callers thought. And, but that's one of the ways that I got over the initial. Reading, and, reading uh, yeah. Dan, is a viable method of calling. Uh, I learned the caller school I went through. Now, I'm, mind you, this was over 50 years ago. Uh, that's what they taught us. Sit down, write everything out on a three by five card, stand up there, put it up in front of you, read it. Um, the problem with that is it's sort of a dead end. Uh, it the calls become lyrics more than anything. I'm not telling you don't start that way because you go over the material enough, it's going to become familiar to you eventually. 
Now, the college schools, uh, they should have, if they don't have, they should have a syllabus that has all of the material that they cover in the schools. Now, I've had newer callers come out and say, well, how do you do this? I said, we covered that in school. Look in your syllabus. Go back, read it. Yes, there's a ton of stuff that we try to cover in the schools. Uh, that's what people pay for. You, you've got a variety of experience coming in to those schools, typically. Everybody from ground zero to, well, I've called a few years, but I want to get something more. So you go through the syllabus and you try to explain everything within it, give examples, give everybody, everybody the chances, ask the questions. You're not talking about a weekly school uh, that's going to go on throughout a year. I'm talking about the, uh, what most of the call and lab accredited coaches do when they advertise, okay, here we've got a long weekend or we've got uh, uh, a 40 hour course in learning how to be a square dance caller. They do cover the material uh, typically uh, and they should, but you're not going to get it all. It's not going to soak in. It's not going to answer all the questions. Uh, there's so much, but they try to give you the place to go get them. And that syllabus is usually the place to start. I'm going to yeah. chime in my two cents on that because as you were talking about all these caller schools, I kept relating that back to how we teach our dancers to dance. And at a caller school, if we are saying, here, we're trying to teach multiple levels, we're giving you all this information, you're not going to understand it, take it home, learn it, try and sort through it. It's, it's almost as if we're doing the same thing with our dancers. If you're trying to teach multiple different levels, you're moving on faster than what they're ready. It's not working. I have seen what I would consider some good people, good quality people that I think would make great callers, go to a caller school and get totally, I mean, they just give up because it's too much, too quick, too fast. I think restructuring the caller schools is a good idea because we're all about getting a good foundation. That's not happening the way the caller schools are structured now. You don't get your good foundation before you move on and on and on and on and on. And I know I was very first, uh, well, the second caller school I went to, I was put in an intermediate group. And I knew I was missing some of the basics in that group because there was stuff they were talking about that I had no idea what they were talking about. Janet, you, uh, you brought up a good point is the analogy between training callers and training dancers or teaching callers and teaching dancers. I've been saying for quite a while, well, first of all, the, the caller, edu caller lab, caller training committee decided, as we all know, there's so many different parts to calling, the choreography, the presentation, the booking skills, the whole, the whole deal, the enunciation. Um, and caller coaches have decided that they've got to make their students aware of all everything in the caller lab curriculum. And in a short period of time, I'm talking about something less than five years, uh, you just can't do this. So I've been thinking that what we there are really two forms to learning, one or to teaching. One is presenting things, and the other is training people to do it. And these caller lab accredited college coach schools present all the different things you have to learn, but they don't have enough time to train you to do it. When we teach dancers, we go slowly and as Barry Johnson was saying last time, give them a break and then start again. Um, we're training them to dance. And some of the scholar schools lately have been trying to pick one topic for, for slightly more experienced dancers, callers that know a little of the basics and train them. Wade Driver's done some on training on singing calls. Um, I'm doing some Zoom sessions on training to use mental image, but it, it's, you just can't, you can't do the whole thing at once. Um, but it's good to know about all these things too. So it's really a happy balance. You just can't, say, I want a badge that says I'm a caller. Um, I do want to throw in one quick antidote 
um, about when I was in this barely transition point that, that um, Dan's talking about. I was at a caller school in 1970. Um, one of the callers got up, started calling. He was supposed to do his thing. He was much less experienced than I. And he got up and said, head two couples, go right and left through. Whoops, I made a mistake, go back. And he had a memorized routine and had no idea what it was doing or what he was calling. And I took him aside after I noticed that none of the coaches took him aside. And he said, when you called right and left through, what happened out there? Well, the dancers went over there and that wasn't what I was planning. I said, what could you have called to get you back so you could call what you were planning? He said, I guess I could have called another right and left through. And then he, the next time he got up to call, it was obvious that he'd been not only memorizing his sequences, but thinking about what was going on out there. Um, it's, a, it's a step that, that we're trying to point out now. And, and it, I'm not sure I would have caught that as, a, as an experienced coach, but as a newer caller then, I, I think I was able to help him. When you're, when you're learning to call, you're gonna have to do a lot of, uh, if it's not obvious, you're gonna have to do a lot of uh, work uh, you know, on your own. Uh, based on on what you've picked up from from many teachers, I think historically uh, the way that a lot of callers have learned is you get yourself a mentor caller, um, uh, you know, who's going to take you on and uh, you know sort of teach you one on one. Uh, if you're, of course, you may not be lucky enough to have somebody uh, near you who who will do that or who's willing to do that and whatever. And another thing is these uh, you know jam packed. Uh, uh, weekend uh, type schools that everybody does, whether they're doing uh, let's show you everything or whether they're trying to be more focused on a particular area like uh, like delivery or singing or something or choreography. Uh, those are uh, those are really valuable. But another structure for caller schools. Um, and again, you you have to be lucky enough to live someplace where somebody is doing this because uh, well, what you do is you have you have a meeting every week or every other week or something like that for a couple hours instead of one, you know, giant thing. And that gives you an opportunity to get some material and then take it away and work with it however you're going to do that. Maybe you're even be lucky enough to have a club somewhere that will let you play with them uh, or, you know, get some people in your basement or whatever. Um, the, you know, the problem with that is that uh, you just have to be lucky enough to live near somebody who's going to do that because uh i mean that's the big thing with the with the weekends is that you can travel to them and uh get a whole bunch of experts uh, uh to talk to you and work with you all at once but uh, when i started i had a lot of people um uh sort of mentoring me and uh at, and i think that uh and I, on the other hand i spent about 40 hours a week working on it myself in addition to that but uh the uh, uh, you know, if you can find somebody, you know, in your area somewhere that you can go to periodically, uh, who will, uh, who will help you out. That's e extraordinarily, uh, valuable. So it occurs to me that the, the thing that most had the value to me, uh, when I was learning to call was the Sunnyvale callers workshops. And I'm wondering if I'm not sure I can drag my wife out to be a, a checker dancer, but for Janet's uh, thing, you know, maybe we can find a way to get two people together on Zoom and to dance to four uh, to four person material for you. I'd like to make a comment if I could. Pipe up. Um, I think the word coach is a misnomer because they are not actually coaching; they're lecturing. They they have a weekend and they lecture. Uh, certainly some of them do analyze their participants, but really that's what is needed initially. I think looking at the two examples that have been given tonight where different levels of calling it and they're trying to learn at those levels, there needs to be some analysis of what they need and then they need to be coached on that path that's being recommended for them over a period of time. And I think maybe the, the term coach is a misnomer uh, in this regard, that they're not actually being coached to learn to call. They're actually being lectured. This is what you, this is all the stuff you'll need to know, but 
Uh, we're not going to tell you how to do it just yet. I, uh, I can't speak for all of the collar coaches schools that they put on, but anybody that's been to one of my schools, we start out with what I assume probably all of them do, which is chicken plucker. There's a reason why we do that because that is the basic traffic pattern of all of our choreography. It's going to go back and forth across that grid, just pure and simple. Uh, and we do coach them on calling. They all get their time on the microphone. They all get uh, worked with individually. Uh, and I'm there again, I can't speak for other color, uh, accredited schools, but I am assuming that they do the same things. Uh, it's important, like Janice said, to know uh, the arrangements. Now there's, you can demonstrate the arrangements, you can tell them about them, but you have to get on the formations, you have to get on the relationships, all of these other things, as, as explaining what it is we're talking about. Now, not knowing what a corner box is, it's probably in the syllabus. You need to look it up. Callers, call. You're going to learn to call. You need to look up the material. Start simple. Build on it. And you'll get there. It's not going to happen overnight. But it'll never happen unless you're putting the material to work. Just understanding it's not good enough. You have to use it. I like the one thing Alan said when he mentioned about um, a lecture, because I was thinking, well, compare this to a college course. Um, you have someone who lectures in a college course, but a lot of times those college courses would have prerequisites to them. So if our caller schools had, quote, prerequisites to it, so if you had a caller school that was a little more advanced, focusing on something different, they would need to put out that said you would already need to know this particular information because we're building off of that. So literally your new, new, new caller schools, they wouldn't have to know anything. And then you could have intermediate schools where you'd have to know, you know, what modules were, what all this other stuff was so that you have prerequisites. And if somebody didn't know some of those prerequisites and they wanted to attend that school, then they know they would have to learn that before they attended that school. I'm frankly kind of shocked, Janet, at the at the at the things that you're saying about uh, and i guess it's not just one caller school but but several and and, and i agree totally with uh, daryl i mean they <laughs> the, if people running these schools ought to be very organized uh and uh, all of these you know things that uh, that you're saying why didn't they do this and daryl saying well golly they should I, i'm i'm shocked that there are schools out there that don't that, that don't do those things i mean i i can't i'm just speechless. Uh, That's the reason for the accreditation. Uh, when Collar Lab started out the accreditation program, it was to find Collar teachers that knew all of this stuff. Now there's lots and lots of Collar schools going that are not accredited. Uh, my experience... The, the, te the, testing, the testing involved in becoming accredited at Collar Lab was one of the hardest things that I've ever been tested on. Uh, I think Don will agree with me on that. One of my experiences uh, with two caller lab accredited uh, caller coach caller schools were very similar to Janet's, where there wasn't there wasn't nearly the amount of this is the here's a where you can start before the school starts that I would have liked. Or are Caller Labs supposed to be like Caller Lab one or Caller School 101 and 102 and then 204 or something like that? Or is, are all Caller Schools supposed to be teaching at the same level or some of them start at one point and take you higher or they start from the basic uh, newbie and take you up to a basic caller? Is that how Caller Schools are supposed to be? Or are they all, are they all supposed to be all encompassing? Well, I'm going to jump in and I'm going to tell you what my experience has been at the, I, I've been to four accredited caller schools and each time the first night you got there, you literally were given a chance to get on stage and either do a patter or a singer 
Um, they assigned you what you were going to do. And based on that performance, you were put into a group of your learning level. One of the, some of these questions you guys should be saving because I've been working with trying to get the head of the Call Lab Caller Coach Committee to do a presentation for us, um, talking about why go to a, an accredited caller coach school versus another, or why go to one that's not an accredited caller coach. To become an accredited caller coach, one of the many, many things required is you've got to have taught at least 50 hours of doing caller training. And if people only go to caller coaches, go to schools of accredited caller coaches, nobody else is gonna get a chance to do any training and get their hours in. Um, I want to point out one of Dan's kind of comments or a point. Daryl was talking earlier about the, the new, you know, you've got to learn about your arrangements and what have you. When I was starting out as a caller, if you told me I've got to learn about arrangements, I would have no idea what that meant. Uh, I didn't know what sequence meant. Um, jumping into one last item and then I'll back out again, but I teach chicken plucker early, but I don't teach it as a, as a path or a thing. Well, I take callers, this is what you're doing, but I want you to memorize this bare bones chicken plucker routine. Because like John Hawley was saying, he needed a written thing so he didn't have to concentrate on choreography. He could concentrate on learning the presentation aspect. Um, I have callers for the presentation, I'll have them memorize this chicken plucker, plucker thing so they don't have to think about it. They can just call this stuff that would bore, would, would drive most dancers crazy, but in the school, it was something just to get them to say words that they knew or get them to move dancers in, in a regular way that they knew so they could practice, so we could work on presentation or timing or, or all sorts of other aspects. And with that, I'll bow out again. I don't I have just a uh, one. Uh, just give me a, as long as we're at that point. My syllabus, and we start our schools always have with the people that at are attending getting up on the microphone, doing whatever it is they're po possibly able to do. Uh, and we begin with what you call chicken plucker, I call it basic traffic pattern. And it is chicken plucker with words, written material, uh, and in a, on a sheet that shows the uh, rhythm as it applies to each of those words and phrases in the chicken plucker. And that's where we begin with the brand new callers, is just trying to get them through that one figure. Now, if we can do that, we figure we've succeeded in getting them started. Uh, but uh, there again, uh, I have not attended all of the uh, accredited schools. But I assume that because they passed the testing to become accredited, they at least know this stuff. Well, so, Mark. Uh, sorry, well, sorry, go ahead. Uh, yeah, Mark, Mark was wanting to pipe in here. I'll put something to the side here. Okay, I'm a new caller. I still consider myself a new caller, even though I've been trying to call since about uh, 2014, 15, somewhere around there. Um, when I started out, kind of the same thing as you, Dan, I kind of got talked into it by my club. And it was fun at first. Everybody was supportive at the club and then everybody got tired of it because it wasn't clicking in. And I was reading off the papers, getting singing call lyrics and combining them to make patterns and stuff. But it just was never clicking and started talking to more and more callers and everybody's telling me, you need to go to caller school. So I ended up going to two caller schools and I came home from both of them with way too much information that didn't make any sense. 
And at both caller schools, when I signed up for them, it's what level you are you? I'm a brand new caller. And every call, pretty much every caller, except for our local club caller who lives at the time, he lived about 120 miles away and he came up every week uh, to teach our class. Uh, square dance class, not calling class. And so getting with him all the time wasn't an option to have him as a mentor like that, other than while we were at class talking in between tips. But every other caller I've ever talked to is, and you know, I'm trying to talk about learning to call and stuff. What everybody else has been saying, they talk like you understand it all. And that you know that this is an equivalent of this, and this is a corner box, and this is a 1P, 2P, 5P, whatever. And it's just was too much. And it, after that second caller school, I was about ready to just, I ain't going to be able to get this. This is just, I'm not smart enough. That's the way I felt. And, but then another club we have up here is the Handy Capables Club, which I'm the caller for now. I would go there in Angel all the time. And one of the other dancers there had told the caller there that uh, I was trying to learn to call and he was moving out of state. So he asked me if I would start teaching them. And he, what he told me is what actually made it seem possible for me to do it. He told me Start like you're one of the dancers. You learn that first call, you teach them that night. And then you learn the next call and you learn the next call and just work with what you're teaching. And that made sense. So I tried it and it was working. It still didn't help with everything. Everything still, I couldn't go to a club and call a tip or anything. It wasn't clicking, but I was able to teach my handy capable. So I stuck with it. And up until COVID-19, it's never clicked. Now we start having these Zoom sessions. Mel has his class on Saturdays. You guys have this one. And all this stuff is clicking. I can't wait to get some real people to call to. Because I have learned so much from these COVID classes. And... As far as in the future for new callers after this is all over, I think you need a Square Dance Callers for Dummies book for somebody to read before they go to a caller school or before they try and learn to let them know. Because I was another thing I was told, go to Caller Lab. Caller have, Lab has everything you need to know. My, this is just my personal opinion. Caller lab is worse than going to a caller school. There's a hundred times more information there than there is at a caller school. Now, this is all just me personally on how I learn. So I'm not trying to offend anybody or make any mad, but you wanted new callers' opinions on things, and that's mine. Cool. I'd like, yeah. to, I'd like to chime in for a minute, too. I mean, one of the things that I've been doing here is I've got a I bought a copy of uh, Don's book and I've looked at the SSD and I've got uh, Mel's classes like Mark's been doing. And I also looked at some of the other material. I just been reading a little bit of each one of them and comparing the, uh, comparing the information it gives you a better idea of how, how to come at it from different angles. So um, buying into one program is kind of neat, but looking at all the programs and sort of comparing them all gives you a better foundation too, in my opinion. I, um, Rolf here. I found the hardest thing in beginning was structure. I haven't had the opportunity of going to call at schools. I've been to one. It wasn't an accredited coach, but he did a brilliant job. And what he did, he looked at the people that were in it. They were brand new callers. And he brought himself down to our level and spoke at our level and explained it all at our level. It was Matthew Mills. And he did an absolute, absolutely brilliant job of that. And he made sure it wasn't too much information. 
so you could take in what you were learning, understand it, build on it. He touched on some things, but he didn't overdo it. So a bit like when you're learning to dance and you'll have a night, you're brain dead. You don't want to go somewhere and be absolutely brain dead because then you're not taking it in. But the hardest bit was there's so much information out there. Where do you start? What do you look at? And that's where I had trouble. What steps are there? Mel's helped a lot with that. Um, talking to callers on the way, um, Alan Kerr said to me once, swing through, work out what swing, swing through is, see what it does. And I hadn't had anyone say that. So starting new with just being a dancer and not knowing where to start was one of the biggest problems. My second problem was being female. I had males teaching and they're getting you to watch number one and, and four. Females watch their corners, one and two. It took me a year before I realised, and it was only, I'd be watching one and four, I'd play with the dogs, I'd be watching one and two naturally, and have to refocus. So bring it back to basics. Give us focus of where you start. And that's from someone that hasn't got the opportunity to go to a caller school or not very often. So I, I told, I totally okay. agree with, can you hear me? I, yes. I totally, I, I totally agree with Ross and Janet. Um, I am probably one of the newer newbie callers. And so I found out about caller school the night or so before I went. So, and when, and when I talked, it was, oh, that's perfectly fine, come in green. When people started talking about zero lines and zero boxes, zero to me meant being on a static square, that was zero. Nobody, had, nobody gave me the concept of there's a get in first and then you have a zero for a corner box, because that, you know, I didn't know what a zero box was. So I was lost. I had no concept whatsoever. I think Mel said that when I first started, I was writing numerous notes until we started doing presentations that you could record and I could actually look at later on. The new callers that I've talked to keep saying over and over again, we have no vocabulary. It's going over ahead. There's no point giving us lessons for five, seven hours when by Hour three, we're on overload. You know, it's better to spread it out and give us the information that we can retain than give us so much that we, it's not that you guys don't know what you're talking about, is if you can't bring it down to the level that we can comprehend, you're wasting your time. You're, all you're doing is making the new people feel stupid. You know, and that's, whoever I've talked to said, we, we, we feel stupid. And I know of people that have quit because they figure they're just never going to learn. Why bother? And especially the ladies, because we're, it's like round dancing where the ladies are going backwards. So now the female callers are taught to do it, the male version. And so we're trying to turn it around on our head to make it the way you guys are, are doing it. While we've been taught as dancers, to do it as ladies and I can do both position. So I already had an advantage to that, but there's caller, female callers that started out and all they had was the female position. It's like, are you kidding me? Right? So, it, I mean, if, un, until COVID, it was like, there's no way that we could learn some of this stuff as a female caller without having to do m more extra work that the guys just weren't getting that we're doing all this additional work. Brenda Starr was a great dancer and Ginger Rogers did it backwards in heels. Right. I, I, I feel like I'm trying to defend college schools. Uh, you're making uh, comments about college schools that you've attended. I wonder how many of them were accredited schools, but uh, you might say something about that. Uh, uh, yes, 
so much material. There's just no way that you're going to get it all the first time. It just isn't going to happen. Uh, but a good point on uh, teaching from the man's perspective rather than the girl's perspective. No doubt about it. Uh, John Hawley, the same things have to be learned for an advanced cha challenge caller as need to be learned for a beginning, you know, uh, beginner through mainstream callers. The same things apply to both. You have different formations, you have different concepts and things in advance and challenge, but basically it's still just a matter of arm turns and uh, passing and things like that. It, it, it all boils down to the same thing. The schools, so many of them that I've heard about, and I've had so many students come back and they say that, uh, well, they taught us how to find the corner, but they didn't teach us how to call. And that I hear over and over and over again. Finding the corner is the last thing you want to do. You need to learn how to call and move the dancers smoothly, interestingly, and then you can apply one of the methods of resolution. But uh, there again, every caller school I'm sure is different but I'm still sure that they probably are doing what they can to try to give somebody the, a foundation to build on and callers call. So the more you call, the easier it's going to get. So uh, I, I, I'd kind of like to see discussion move in a different direction. I don't know how much time we have or if we've already run over, um, but we've been talking almost exclusively about college schools, and I feel like some of that might be my fault. And if people were hoping for something different, I apologize. Um, but um, one, another, another topic I might be interested in is something I've noticed in online interaction in caller discussion groups. Um, and, uh, you know, I feel like when a lot of newer callers post questions, um, depending on which group that you're in, there tend to, I, I, I see two common responses. One is, well, newbie callers shouldn't be worrying about that. And another common response is, you know, thinking, thinking about calling this way is what is killing square dancing. Um, I have seen that way too many times. And I think as a newer caller, there is there is some reason that we are excited about calling, that we're interested about calling. We want to engage with a community. And so I think one thing that you know, it would be helpful if, you know, a lot of the most experienced callers did was try to try to keep a positive attitude, you know, engage people when they ask questions and, you know, maybe, maybe they're not learning stuff in exactly the right order, or maybe, you know, maybe they're not learning something that they can use right now. But the fact that they're asking questions and talking about it, like that seems like a thing that you want to encourage. And or that, that, is def that is a way that I want to be encouraged as a newer caller. Um, I, I've got to jump in here for, uh, for one thing and want to throw in a couple of other things. Let me do the one thing is that we have passed our hour um, so that if anybody has other obligations, feel free to leave um, and not feel guilty like we think you're abandoning us. Um, and the others, please hang around because we generally continue talking afterwards um, and really get into interesting stuff. I also wanna thank Dan, not only for doing the engineering this time, but also for opening us up to some good discussions. I want to thank all the experienced callers that have joined us to either throw in their two cents worth or hopefully better yet, listen to what barriers we are putting up for these 
poor people that have to start from scratch and we've forgotten what scratch is. I especially want to enjoy, uh, enjoy, <laughs> I did enjoy, <laughs> thank the, the newer callers, the less experienced callers who have contributed um, comments and thoughts. Um, and as we continue discussion, if we are going to, and I plan, I have a few more things to say, I want to encourage those people newer or, or more experienced that we haven't heard from yet to give us your one cents worth or three cents worth, depending on what you want to do. There's, there are a lot more people listening that probably could be talking to. Um, the couple of things that I wanted to throw in here, the, that's officially it. Thanks everybody, yay. I'm glad you all came and participated. Now, the, the things that I wanted to throw in and I thought I would make them unofficially after um, closing session, but um, we've talked about caller schools giving you, because they sort of feel they have to, a little bit of everything. Um, our sessions here on Saturday, and again, I can't believe we've got 20 of them already, have not really had a theme because I've scratched up trying to get people to talk about different things. Um, and now that I think about it, that's been a good thing. We've touched on this, we've touched on that, and we've spent an hour or two um, delving into whatever topic we happen to be talking about. And it's been quite varied in, in doing it. And that, that's been a good thing, I think. Um, and as usual, my pitch, if you've got the topics you want to talk, want talked about or want to talk about, um, I'm not only open for suggestions, but looking for people. Um, one more thing, Daryl, and then I'll call on you. Um, I want to, this is another topic, I want to defend Caller Lab and say, yes, you should go to Caller Lab. You should join Caller Lab and you should go, but look at it in a different way. It is not a caller school. It is not where you're going to learn lots of things. Caller Lab is the professional association of people in the profession, whether that profession be their only profession or a sidelight. Um, it's a place where we get together and talk about professional problems like coming up with um, insurance to cover callers equipment or callers liabilities. It's a place where we talk about trying to standardize the lists, the different programs of, of calls so that we can help the activity by making it standard and so that we can if we get the opportunity to travel to one of the many places that we see represented here, um, we know which calls that dancers have heard of and which ones they haven't. But in addition, there are a lot of presentations directed at newbies, oldies, what have you, where you do learn things. In addition, and for me lately, it's the big thing is getting in fact, has been from the beginning, um, getting to meet other callers, um, getting to be one-on-one -on -one with people um, of more experience level, of less, less experience level. Um, and some have become pretty good friends. I see many of you here. Um, one of the, my very first caller lab convention 45 years ago or something, where I met Daryl Clendenin, and we've been good friends ever since. And, and I see Ryan Clark, who we've become friends mostly online, but after having met in person at Caller Lab. And the same with Chris Jensen, even though that's been not only mostly online, but year after year after year at Caller Lab, as well as exchanging visits and all this other stuff. Um, and well, others that I've met through Caller Lab too. It's a, it's a great thing of camaraderie, just rubbing shoulders with people that you, that enjoy the same interests you are, but don't go there with the expectation that it's a caller school because it's not. And some of the conversations can be pretty esoteric. Some can be pretty fundamental. Anyway, with that, I'm going to try to shut up for a while. Daryl, you've got, oh, you had five fingers up. Now you've only got one. Go for it. <laughs> well, that's because I'm only going to take a second here. Uh, 
gang, I, I'll tell you what, I've been running college schools for about 40 years, uh, eh, probably a little bit more than that. But I, I have a lot of material. It's available to you for the asking. I have a, a fairly unprofessional recording of how to deliver patter to square dance music, why we prefer the 2-4 rhythm. And uh, it's fairly simple, like I say, but that's available. All you have to do is ask. Email me. Email me uh, if you don't have this chicken plucker like I described it with the down up uh, rhythm. It's all laid out there. If you have specific things that you want to know about how to call square dancing, I'll send you those parts of the syllabus. My email address, can you see my name on your screen? Quite possibly. It's Daryl at clendenon.net. Makes it really tough to remember, doesn't it? But uh, my annual schools that I taught for so many years, I retired from that. But I still have the material. I'm very, very willing to share it with anybody that would like it. Just let me know. But thank you. And nice seeing everybody again. And Don and Dan, Mark, all you guys that put this stuff on and keep it going. Thank you. I think it's a great thing. Mel, we'll see you later. Um, I do want to throw in before Daryl disappears, teaching presentation and rhythm and using the music is something that I haven't, that I haven't figured out how to do by writing about it. I do it in person and I, I pride myself on what I can help people with. But Daryl sent me a, a paper that he did on um, how to do that. And I was very impressed with the paper. If you have any questions at all, send him for that. Um, and I'm sure he will, you, you will get something out of it anyway. It's a good piece of work. You'll probably, you'll probably get the, the paper and the, uh, the recording as well, if you want. Uh, but I, I'm not going to leave just yet. I want to stick around and see what you go through. Uh, I do have some other things that I have to get to, but that doesn't mean I'm gone. Thank you, everybody. Daryl, send me the recording, please. <laughs> Thought I had, but I will. No, just the written thing. One of the things that I've been doing during this session, and starting off with what John Hawley was doing, was actually just making point notes of some of the things that were coming up. I've sent those to Dan and I'm, I'm hoping he'll summarize those and send them out to everybody or put up on his website for experienced callers. A um, couple of things that really stood out for me in this is one, experienced callers make assumptions about the knowledge level of the people they're trying to teach. And that has always been a very, very bad habit of new callers. That really came to the fore when Don said he was attending a, a dance or a school and the caller called square th or right and left through instead of square through. It wasn't picked up by the people that were teaching him because the presentation was may have been good, may have been bad. They just didn't know what it was that he didn't know he was what it was he was actually presenting. Uh, that's very, very common. And I think, John, you summed it up when you said you started at the plus and advanced when you, you get up and you get a chance to do extemporaneous sight calling and, and start calling. You made a comment about you've got your material prepared to give the dancer experience. And then when you get a chance, you do some extemporaneous sight. I thought that was a brilliant comment. I'm prepared to give the dancer the experience. That's something that's left out an awful lot. And what Janet was saying, new callers are being fed with a fire hose. Many callers start out, especially new callers, start out calling at the advanced level or at the plus level, or in some cases, even the challenge level, because there's a demand for it in their particular area. And as Daryl rightfully said, it doesn't matter what you're calling, you've got to get those basics because the principle is all the same from Alaman left, which is the first move on every single program right up through C4. And you've got to know how to present Alaman left in order to do C4. Without those basics, 
you can't do anything. But unfortunately, if I have a new caller in front of me that is getting up there and saying, right, uh, Janet, I want you to get up and call a singing call. You've been calling for a while. Here you go. You call an advanced tip. That presentation says, oh, she's an advanced caller. New call or experienced callers make the assumption that you know what's coming. You know the base foundations up through advanced. And wow, what happens after that? You're treated as an advanced caller, assuming you have all that knowledge. The best advice I can give to any new caller right now is if anybody is teaching you or presenting or mentoring with you and you don't understand what they're saying, stop and say, I don't understand that. Can you explain what it is you're doing to me? I don't understand how that works. Um, I don't know who was said with the chicken plucker. Oh, they said, you just use the chicken plucker. And they kept going. I stopped at the chicken plucker because I didn't know what the heck they were talking about. And they just kept on going because they assume I know. Don't assume that we know what you know. Because as new callers, you know a lot more than you think. But we don't know what it is that you don't know. Anyway, that's enough for me. Can we hear some opinions or thoughts from people we haven't heard from before? Like, what the heck are you talking about? May I say something? I'm, uh, we had some similar uh, uh, discussions uh, in some groups here in Germany. And uh, what my thoughts were, I'm missing two, two steps. Right. Uh, the first thing is, uh, my impression is that too many callers start uh, without ever th having thought about being a caller. So as Dan said, okay, he was asked, there's a group, there's somebody that uh, is missing. You, you look smart enough, you can do it. And uh, it was the same I started 20 years ago. A caller said, okay, I may go back to school. I'm not available for a while. Oh, well, we need somebody to jump in. And uh, my impression is that this happens to lots of people. And uh, then the next step is, okay, you, you start, uh, tried it and then go to a caller school. And then exactly that is happening. What I think Janet was it, uh, described, well, it, you are overwhelmed with uh, information uh, and, and uh, you can't cope with it. And uh, I'm missing a step before, uh, where, where somebody sits with you and says, okay, if you really want to start this, uh, you need to be aware of that. This and this and this and this is coming up to you. Are you really willing to do that? Is that, uh, and then you have to learn, 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 work, work, work. Is that something you want to do? And this is a step I, I think most of the, of maybe most of us are missing. We, we say, okay, we, we raise a finger and then you are a caller. And uh, the second thing that I'm missing is that uh, after you've been to a caller school and so on, and that is a lot of material. And, and uh, I think there's no other chance of throwing at least the basics to you and then uh, having, but then, the follow-up is something you are on your own, more or less, I guess. Most of us sit there and, okay, we have understood we have to work and then we work through it, through some things and we work through some other things, but nobody, so, so what I'm missing is uh, the mentoring and, and somebody said, well, if you're lucky, you have somebody you can turn to, but I ho already ho hoped that the organizations, and I don't know which are the organizations, your, yours are different than in our country, but uh, that somebody would organize something and saying, okay, here's a list of mentors that would uh, be willing to help. And if I see this, uh, I think something we are learning from this COVID thing is uh, with all these online things, uh, often it was a problem of uh, distance. So if the next caller is 300 miles away, well, he, how often can he join you? But these are, this is a time where we learned that it would work online. 
And so I hope for the future that this will be extended maybe into some, some uh, larger things where people say, okay, I offer my help and uh, we can organize things for, for newer callers. So that uh, is the second point. Excellent it's, point, Gerhard. There are a lot of callers, accredited coaches and non-accredited coaches that are doing online mentoring or formal sessions. I know, Don, you're doing formal sessions on mental imaging. Uh, Daryl, I think you've got a few people coming up. Tom Miller's doing a few of these things. I'm doing a number of these things, uh, as are a number of callers. And the learning level and the scale of one-on-one -on -one is unprecedented. You know, it, it, if anything positive has come out of COVID, it's the fact that we've actually gone back to teaching callers how to call and teaching the basics and dancers saying, right, I miss this. I want to get up even virtual dancing in your yard. They've got a virtual camping weekend coming up. I have no idea how that's going to work, but going square dance camping for a virtual weekend. That's the dedication that people that like this activity put into it. It is a lot of work. We've missed the boat somewhere. We've now got the rope that's holding the boat in the water. It's time to pull it back in and get back on and learn how to use that boat. Hey there, guys. Go for Can you it. Hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, so I've uh, I've been calling for thirty years, and uh, I've my I think my experience through through this process has been completely different than, than most of the callers uh, that are going through it now um, because there, there certainly is a lot more structure now available to the, uh, the newer callers. Uh, and, and it's, you know, back, back when I went through it, our local callers association put together a caller school that, that I went to. Um, and for the most part, it was reasonably useless to go to. Um, however, the, the, the best part of it that, that I enjoyed and, and that, that I felt was useful was uh, they, would, they would let us get up and call and then we would have a peer review. And everybody in the room would talk honestly about how well you did and, and what you were capable of doing. And it was, it was probably one of the best parts of the entire caller school, but it wasn't technical. It wasn't, uh, there wasn't anything uh, amazing about it other than the fact that honest opinions were in the room and nobody was being insulted. You were given constructive criticism on everything that was required of you. Um, however, when I started, uh, I, was, I was 10 years old when I started dancing. And uh, the, the area where I dance is in the Pacific Northwest. And unlike every other place in the world, I actually learned how to, I trained to compete as a square dancer and compete as a, as a caller. Uh, so it's it's completely different than what normal recreational dancers do. So by the time I was 12, uh, dancing in a square, I was able to uh, guess at what the caller was going to do to resolve the square. And almost 100% of the time, I was I was successful. And by the time I was 12, the the caller for the club was seeing me in the square, you know, guessing what he was going to do to resolve and and saying stuff out loud um what what they wanted me to do at 12 years old was to start learning how to call and at that point i was i was too scared to grab a microphone and do anything so i didn't actually start calling until i was 17. so that's that's how long it took for me to do it and and it was a, an acting class in high school that that taught me that it, it was perfectly okay to stand there with a microphone um but soon as i started calling um, I was actually able to site call right off the top of my head. And so I never really desired going to a caller school. I, I went to the local association caller school anyways, because it was, uh, it was available, but I found that I didn't really learn very much. Actually, I found I, I got more confused because they were trying to force a site resolving method down my throat that I thought wasn't very efficient at all. Um, so then I spent many, many years and, and mostly I, I was calling advanced and challenge and I wasn't doing very much mainstream plus. And, and then I sort of worked my way down. And the, the problem with a, a competitive square dancer uh, 
calling is most of the things that you call tend to be too hard for the floor. So the thing that I had to learn was, was what standard formations were, what standard positions were, and how to apply them to dancers uh, so that you don't kill them. And uh, uh, so, that's, so that's how it went. And then I ended up uh, being mentored by a caller from California by the name of uh, Dave Stevens. And uh, Dave Stevens at the time was one of the best advanced and challenged callers on the planet. And um, uh, he was doing dances in Vancouver every Friday night. And at the end of the dance, we'd go to a 24 hour restaurant, sit there and get the creamers out on the table and we'd be working out choreography. And it was great. It was, it was probably some of the best training I've ever received in my life. And the weird part is it's only been in the past, past maybe 10 years or so that I've been going to the nationals and, and showing up to the G GSI caller schools with the um, uh, caller lab uh, accredited callers. And every time I sit there and I watch them do stuff, I go, oh, so that's what they call that. Because I, I didn't actually know the names of some of the things that they were talking about. Um, and then, or the, some of the things that I knew that, that I had figured out by, by just being a dancer and by, by calling on my own, I had no idea that some of that stuff had names. And um, it was, I think I had a session with Don over the phone. We spent an hour and a half on the phone talking about mental image. And he was rather shocked at how quickly I was able to pick that up. So it's, you know, it's my, my journey has been a little different than most of the callers. But anytime I talk to newer callers, the first thing I ask, I ask them is I say, what does a swing through do? And I said, I, I want you to understand the mechanics of the call <clears throat> so that you can, when you're calling, you can say, okay, well, I want to get this dancer over here or this dancer over there. How do I do that? And when you say, uh, you know, I know what a swing through does, you say, okay, great. Well, a swing through takes two dancers that are once removed from each other and put them together in a, in a right progression. Well, if you know that, and that's something that you know off the top of your head, then you know if you see dancers on the floor that are once removed from each other and you want to get those two dancers together, but on that side of the square, you say, oh, I'm going to do a swing through and get them there. Well, the fun part is you can do that for every single call on the list. Not only do that with every single call on the list, but you can also do what are called before and after pairs where you, where you take a call and you figure out all the calls that you can use before it and all the calls that you can use after it. And those are very handy things to know. Um, you know, I, I found like my entire time, like I, I, I've been to these caller schools and they, they talk about Fazer and they talk about, you know, this particular formation or that particular formation. And as, as a challenge caller and as a caller who's been calling for 30 years, I couldn't care less about any of those formations. Um, because I don't use them. Um, when, when I'm calling, everything is extemporaneous. Everything is off the top of my head. Um, I don't use modules. I don't use zeros. Although I, I do know a bunch of equivalents, and it's mostly because I figured them out with my checkers. But other than that, um, you know, I, I find that the, the Caller Lab schools are very interesting, and they do have a ton of information. But I, I do, when looking around the room, I see a lot of eyes glazed over because they're just being overloaded with information. So, you know, maybe, maybe a little more focus during those schools might be a better idea uh, rather than cramming it all down their throats. May I make a side note? Uh, if we have somebody from this uh, competition uh, uh, area in the Northwest, um, I always see all these videos about the PNT SDF uh, in, on YouTube, and uh, I'm impressed uh, what what young people can do. And uh, well, each time I mention it uh, somewhere, I'm hit. Uh, no competition, no competition. Don't talk about it. But I would uh, love to hear something more about uh, these events also. Maybe this was uh, something that uh, others would be interested in as well at, in one of your sessions, Don, I don't know. But we have some expert here. Why not ask him? 
I, I started in Germany too, Gerhard, and that was one of the first things that was drilled into me is square dancing is not competitive. There's no competition. Yes. There's no competition. Uh, when I went to the States, I found out at some of the big festivals, they have elimination competitions with prizes. When I moved to Australia, I found out, I think in the 40s and 50s, they not only had competitions, but they had things like $10,000 prizes for the winners, the winning <laughs> squares of the competition. That's how big it was here. Entire mm -hmm. companies were advertising, uh, clothing companies were advertising square dancing competitions with $10,000 you know, twenty thousand dollar prizes, ten thousand dollars to the second square. This is this was how big it was. Competitions not not to be underrated. Yeah. yeah. The, um, I believe but, that in in uh, also for young people it's appealing. I mean, if the, what 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 sports are they doing? All of them are competition, and uh, we want to appeal for younger people. So, well, but. Uh, uh, I'm in Germany, I should shut up. Actually, here in the northeast of US where I square dance wise grew up and physically also, um, it, same as what you had Gerhard, no competition, it's no good. We had a few local callers that would do an elimination tip now and then. And I was at a dance of one and, um, you know, the rule was that if, if your square broke down, you had to sit down and they'd give a badge um, to the square that managed to, to stand. It, it was, <laughs> the badge was an I did it that read more like idiot. Uh, <laughs> and, and my square won that and I never did get the badge. But um, anyway, so going to my first caller school after that, um, which was a, a Jim Mayo one week at a time kind of thing. And I, I'll talk more someday about, and I'm sure I have, what a wonderful session it was. Um, Jim said, we don't want competition. Some people do this elimination thing and um, it's really not good for the activity. And I said, well, I went to a college that did that and we had a lot of fun and I don't see what was wrong with it. And he said, yeah, you're square one. So eight people felt good. But what about the other 100 dancers that were there? They didn't win. Um, it made me think. And so I've never done anything like that. But I do see some of the videos of, of some of the stuff that um, the Northwest does. And Brian, you're officially being asked right now if you'd be willing, <laughs> willing to consider doing a session and saying the pros and cons and in telling the specifics of it and how it attracts younger people and such. It might be a, an interesting session for us. Or should I wait in one of our, our Facebook Messenger conversations to talk about it? <laughs> yeah, we, we can probably do something like that. That uh, wouldn't be a big deal. Um, oh. you know, func functionally, uh, it's, it's exactly like Little League. Um, you know, probably the worst part about the Pacific Northwest Teen Square Dance Festival uh, are the parents of the dancers. <laughs> you know, um, you know the, the, thing, the thing that I found most horrifying was, was watching a parent uh, you know, yell at his kid because they couldn't do a right and left through properly. It was, and, and, and it's very silly because in a lot of cases, the parents don't dance either. Um, but they're yelling at their kid for not being able to dance properly. And I, I, you know, and that part of it's kind of ugly. But when you, when you look at the camaraderie amongst the kids, uh, even even the the clubs who are competing against each other, uh, they're they're actually having a, a great deal of fun. Uh, even though when you watch the videos, everyone says, "Oh, they look like robots," or "Oh, they look like this." Well, they're they're supposed to look like perfection. They're supposed they're that's how that's how we're trained. You know, we're we're trained to make it look like it's supposed to look. Otherwise, uh, you know, what are you doing? Um, what about, you know, go ahead. About the Jim Mayo ingredient about. The winners feel great, but the others don't feel as good. Um, well, just just like in any uh, any sports activity, um, you you have winners and you have losers, and usually what what the people who didn't win do is they get more motivated to win the next year. They work they work harder and they they practice more and they do better. And um, you know uh, there there is a lot of attrition in the teen 
uh, stuff. And you know, most of the most of the teen clubs in the states, the the kids when they when they graduate, they either go off to university or go off to the military, and and then we never see them anymore. Uh, so it's so it's difficult. It's a it's a difficult transition. It's not like it's not like they leave the teen square dance clubs and go to the adult square dance clubs. They go off and and make their own little lives, uh, which is kind of what you expect them to do. Uh, and and it's unfortunate that uh, when you have uh, competitively trained teen square dancers, they're actually not they're not interested in dancing at recreational square dance clubs because the the levels aren't challenging enough for them. Hey, Brian, I've uh, down here in the Puget Sound area, I've, I've met a lot of the kids that have done um, competitive square dance and around dance. And I've, we actually had a couple of the kids that were uh, that won the championship one of the years up in Penticton down here. And it would be kind of neat if you would, uh, if you give a presentation to talk about uh, when they do the, the uh, calling competition too. Yeah, yeah. Well, the, yeah, well, well, we'll do a presentation on that. I don't want to talk about it now, but sure. Um, yeah. I want to throw in a, a comment about why those that don't win sometimes enjoy it. Um, I have a 23-year-old son that while in high school and before was a, a wonderful athlete and soccer was his main thing, but he is also really good at basketball. So we used to enjoy watching the winning team most of the time. They were really good. But one of the, the teams that we played in basketball every year was terrible. They, you know, typically we beat them, you know, 50 to, to 15 kind of thing. And I really liked watching that team. They knew they were going to lose because they were terrible basketball players, but they enjoyed playing the game. They didn't come in with the defeatist attitude. They came in because they liked to play and they kept their spirits up till the last buzzer rang. And I really liked the spirit of them and, and, I'm sure their coach did an awful lot to to make them better people. Yeah, well, one year we had a we had a group of kids, like an entire square of kids from Alaska, that came down to uh, compete, and they were completely in over their heads because they had never competed at the teen festival before, and for the most part, they were recreational square dancers, and so although they did very, fairly well in the display category for for dancing. And what the displays are, are, they just get up and do singing calls and they dance three, three singing calls across the floor. And it's just designed to make it look pretty and, uh, and they have to just dance it well. And they did fairly well at that. And uh, I think they might've even got a trophy, I'm not sure. Um, however, when it came to the mysteries, uh, the mysteries are, are basically challenge level material, but with mainstream and, or mainstream and plus. And uh, they, they couldn't handle any of that. They spent a lot of time you know, standing around or, you know, scuttering around and uh, didn't do very well at that. Um, but that's practice and, and preparation. Uh, unfortunately, they weren't quite prepared for that. The videos that I've seen, of, I think, have been all the mysteries. I'm curious, do, are they judged on presentation, on, on styling? Uh, not for, no, not the mysteries. Mysteries are only designed on time. No, I mean the competitions. Do they have a styling session? Do they have a... Yes. Yep. Well, that's, that's for the singing calls. Okay. Yeah. So that's, uh, so in the morning they do what are called the display calls and those are just singing calls. And so while the squares are being judged for their dancing abilities, the callers are also being judged for their calling ability. I, I guess I shouldn't ask questions like this. We'll save it for our Saturday session. Let's exactly. All over the place. Anyone else we haven't heard from and, and still don't want to be heard from? <laughs> Alan, what do you think of all this? You sp oh, I'm sorry, Carol, you were going to talk. Oh, I was just going to uh, say that when I started, it wasn't really anything to do with calling. Um, some of the students asked, could they, a dancer help them with some of the moves? So I got a group together with CDs, which taught the basics of mainstream. And as we went on, I realized that if I learned how to call, perhaps I would be able to help them better. So I spoke to our caller for the club and said, what do I do? And he said, there's a caller school next week. <laughs> and I'm a bit like the others. I turned, I'd never picked a mic up. And before the end of the week, 
when I'd only literally tried one singing call the night before and they said that was rubbish it's the wrong <laughs> song for you uh they expected me to call a singing call to a dance and I said forget it <laughs> that was nearly going to be my disappearance but I persevered and basically self-taught help from the odd person now and again at various callers and a lot of dolly work um, I teach a class, a beginner's class, which basically is the only time I get to call other than one tip a week because our caller is never off. <laughs> I only ever get to call once. Um, and I tend to find I'm going backwards. But having now seen some of these sessions, I'm basically going back to basics and learning all over again, trying to forget what I've learned or been taught and starting again. But... I've been starting with the sessions and going over them two or three times before I move into the next one because I'm way behind what Mel's got up to. I'm just working on the first one in my own time. And I think that's the only way I can do with it. Are you always welcome to pick up the phone and call or? <laughs> Give me an email, Carol. We can sit down and have another three-hour chat. <laughs> I started with two years of just singing calls and then three years of trying to figure out how to present patter and eventually went to a caller's school. Um, and I thought up until that point, all I needed to work on was choreography. And I learned at the caller school that I learned many, many things. Choreography wasn't one of them because in parallel, I was learning choreography from Jay King's book, Fundamentals of Calling. But I learned so many things about calling. And this was the, the shotgun. You learn everything, although it was spread out over quite a few weeks. At the end of it, I was able to absorb these things, but wasn't able to practice them. And I would frequently say to myself, if you ever learn how to do everything you know how to do, you might become a decent caller. Um, so I enjoyed learning about all these other things, part of calling that it was much more than just the magic of choreography, but there was some intellectual presentation kind of stuff. But um, we each learn differently. Daryl mentioned that he hadn't had the opportunity or I don't know if he called it opportunity to um, do what to, to have dancers um, dancers people in his callers classes like John who are you still yeah John's still here Holly um, still here. who are coming from the top challenge dancers and working their way down from to challenge callers down to, to callers um, one of our very well-known callers and has presented here on um, Barry John, Barry Clasper did that started as a challenge dancer went to a challenge caller and is now working on on becoming competent mainstream callers um, I've had callers in some of my caller schools back when that have done that names you may have heard of like Clark Baker and um, the creator of SD um, Bill Ackerman and it's a different experience. You have to stress different things and it's cool to have them have a basic understanding of what's going on. But it's, um, as I've said many times, this activity is great because it has different slots and different places for all sorts of different interests. A lot of people uh, are uh, frustrated singers and they, uh, they want to be callers so that they have an opportunity to sing. And I, I think sometimes there's a, uh, a bad assumption uh, made by uh, uh, callers, uh, callers uh, teachers uh, and schools that that's, that's everybody. If, uh, if when I had started out, if somebody said, okay, first thing is get up here and do the singing call, that would that, probably been the end of it for me because um, I found uh, singing to be infinitely uh, more intimidating than, uh, than getting up and uh, doing patterns. 
I know that we have a young lady here. She was at a dance, and it was an op open mic, pretty much passing back and forth between all the new callers. And she actually an excellent caller, excellent choreographer, excellent timing with her patter and everything else. And she was terrified of being asked because she was all apologetic. Says, "I don't know how to do a singing call. I can only call patter." And damn, she was good at it. So I feel your pain, Chris. Um, I've noticed. As I mentioned before, we have some people that haven't joined us before. Um, one of those is a person whose name I've heard many, many times, but never had the opportunity to, to meet. And I know he's done a lot of caller training um, in one way or another. Um, Barry Watson, do you have anything you can add to it? Uh, it'd be great to meet you at least face to face, if not voice to voice yet. Yeah, well, that, hi, Don. Uh, it's nice to see everybody. It's a, it feels odd for me because Normally at this time, I'm really busy sleeping because it's uh, 10 minutes before three in the morning here. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> but it's fun. It's just interesting to listen to experiences that everybody's had in some ways. We've all had similar experiences. Uh, looking back at how we first start, um, I can remember uh, when I first decided to call, which was about a year after I'd started dancing, we had a caller school that was being run in Sydney. It used to go every Sunday for six months. So we would have 24 to 26 Sundays in a row of learning to call. But that was only involved in learning to call to be able to do a one night stand and the first two or three nights of a beginner's class. Um, the emphasis was on understanding of what we were doing, uh, understanding of the music, of the rhythm, how we structure, how we put things together, and above all, how we teach. There was more emphasis on the ability to teach than there really was on the ability to call. The very last day of the caller's class, the, the guy who was calling, who was teaching Ron Jones, he said, okay, uh, we've got to have a look at this singing call thing. How many of you got a singing call record? And I never had a singing call record. He said, okay, here, use this one. And that was my introduction to singing calls. And that was the first time I'd ever done a singing call. Fortunately, in those days, um, we rarely changed choreography in the singing call. So a lot of the callers used to use the same thing over and over and over. And as a dancer, you'd get it locked into your head anyway. So I could parrot fashion, you know, repeat everything. So, and I can, I'll never forget it was a really old um, thing. I think it was I'll Come Running, which was on top or something like that. Nowadays, I still use it as a hoedown. But it's, uh, it, it's interesting, the experiences. Uh, we do some things quite differently here. I'd like to just to make a couple of comments. Dan uh, started off talking about and asking about caller run versus um, dancer run clubs. In Australia, 95% of the clubs are all caller run. And that means that, like, I'm a, I have caller run clubs. I've got, you know, basically four groups. I hire the hall. Uh, I have my wife or a friend on the door. I do the advertising. I do everything. The dancers come in. They pay their money at the door. They enjoy. They go home. That's all they have to do. Hopefully, if I've done a good job, they come back, which fortunately for the last 55 years they have been, so I can't complain. Um it's it's interesting how things are, are so different in so many parts of the world. Brian was talking about competition. I've actually been to one of those Pacific Northwest festivals in Vancouver. Um, and when I was up there, the mystery caller was Dave Stevens, who was his mentor. And that frightened the hell out of me. Those guys, and this was probably 35 years ago, the, these kids with, that were dancing, their understanding of choreography was far beyond what I thought I knew. And I thought I was pretty good at it. 
Uh, so it's no wonder that we've had so many great callers like Brian, Steve Edlund, a whole lot that have come from those things up there. In Australia, we also had competition, as Mel uh, mentioned, in the 1950s, they had huge competitions where they might get a thousand people at a dance. And, you know, one of these ones had a, had a prize of like $10,000, which is just it's staggering by our standards today. But we had competition dancing in Australia up till about uh, 15 years ago. But it was a different type of competition than they have uh, up in the Northwest. But yeah, it's, it's fabulous uh, seeing the differences throughout the world. And that's what makes us all unique. I hope everybody's had a, a good time I've really enjoyed this, but I have to say that I have to go to bed. I need, I need my beauty sleep greatly. <laughs> so I will bid you all a good night. And I don't know whether I'll see you in the morning at, in a few hours time for Mel's session. I may sleep in tomorrow. Or oh, Betsy's on tomorrow morning, isn't she? Yeah, she's oh, I mean, I'm talking about difficulty in Michael's. Oh, okay. I, mean, I don't understand that. Gary, it's um, really glad to have you give your two cents worth and to get to know you, start to get to know you. Uh, one of the things that I really enjoyed about these Zoom sessions, not only this one, but all of them, is, as you mentioned, Barry, there's so many differences, regional differences around the world, and this is giving us a chance to bring them together, to compare them, to help make this more, <clears throat> even more universal as we're trying. And it's, it's really good that way. Mm. Uh, Yolanda, were you waving goodbye or wanting to say something? Say uh, well. <laughs> um, another, well, well, I'm after bringing Barry in, another person that I've gotten to know through Zoom and have learned to really respect opinions of um, is Alan Kerr down in Australia. <laughs> Alan, have you got any sage, have you done any caller training or just, I mean, you seem very knowledgeable in the, the whole bit. Um, you'll have to unmute yourself. I don't read lips very well. Uh, my wife does. She, she's a, uh, instructor of, uh, deaf education. So she, <laughs> um, I, I do a, just for my own local callers. I, I, I don't run caller schools or do anything like that. And uh, I, it was really interesting today's session because I can see that to some extent our caller schools are probably structured wrong, wrongly for the needs of, of the actual caller because uh, we do tend to give them a whole syllabus and uh, uh, then expect them to perform. Uh, and really, they do need mentoring. And I think as the, the, they need somebody to analyze what they're doing and saying, well, what do you want to do? It, where's your weaknesses? Where's your strengths? Uh, maybe we can help you with that. And you know, so I think the structure is probably slightly wrong in a way that um, maybe there needs to be you've gone to a school. Maybe the obligation of the school is to follow you up weekly or monthly or and see what your needs are and follow you up. Um, maybe that might produce um, more people staying with the calling activity. Uh, I, I'm, I've got some trainees at the moment and one of them is suggesting he may not continue because suddenly the structure of our national conventions and everything's changing. You can see that you'll never get a chance to call at a national because they're the way they're setting the criteria for calling. Uh, so the motivations of people are different. And so why they come to calling and what, what they expect to get out of it are, are, are different for every person, I think. Yeah. And so maybe it needs to be more personally tailored. I don't know whether that's a, a worthwhile comment or not. But, yeah. You know, we don't expect dancers to learn to dance over a four or five day period. Um, why do we expect callers to learn to call over that short a period when in fact um, 
calling is, is even a step beyond just dancing. So that, that is a good point. Um, as far as a continued thing, Alan, my first caller school with Jim Mayo, I don't recall if it was once a month or once every other week, but it was a periodic thing. Go home, think about it, ask questions and come back. But at the end of it, he said, one of the things that come with paying to, to come to my caller schools is a lifetime subscription to you can pick up the phone and ask me questions anytime you want. Um, and that's something I took him up on. And that's how Jim and I got to be pretty good friends because we spoke a lot on the phone. Plus he was close enough in the area so we'd get together once in a while, as well as callers association meetings. Um, and I ended up using his line too and having people uh, feel free to contact me afterwards and not just take, take what they've gotten so far and some actually took them, took me up on that. Well, I posted up I posted up on the chat about what did they ever think about structuring their callers like they do dancers where you go basic, mainstream, plus, advanced. Did they ever ever they ever, ever done caller schools where they had and they structured them up in segments like 101, 200, 300 series? Has that ever been considered? I've never heard it done or considered, but it's I mean, the caller schools, they say, well, we'll break you into the beginners groups or the, the advanced groups, advanced callers. And I think Janet was, some of us were talking about that before. But I don't think they've ever set levels of, of calling. I mean, basically, you pick up a mic and do one singing call and you can call yourself a caller. <laughs> there, there are a few caller schools that are actually structured that way now. Uh, I know Ken will do that, and there's a few other ones that are along that line uh, where they cater to a specific ability of callers who are experienced, who are very experienced, etc. Um, but one of the things that has come out lately over the last six, seven years in caller instruction and caller schools is this movement towards limiting the amount of topics but presenting the topics themselves in three different formats. So if we're going to talk, for instance, about site resolution, if that's going to be, it'll be site resolution for new callers, site resolution for intermediate callers, and site resolution for experienced callers. And the format would be, here's the principles, here's the basic, here's the basic understanding for new callers. Here's how to really make the most of it for uh, the more experienced callers. And for the really experienced callers, this is how you want to mentor and teach new callers how to use the material. And they'd be broken into three different sessions. You'd have, um, this was how our, our national convention, the uh, ACF Callers Federation um, was going to be structured. There was only eight topics on the five days or the four days that were being presented. Three callers that were presenting were presenting the same topics to each group, but at a different level. But the course material was exactly the same for everybody. So everybody would get the course material, which was about a 90 page book of all the material that's being presented, all the background, all the foundation material, everything else, the syllabus, everything that went with it, so that you had all the material, the discussion was focused on how to use that material at your level. And then there was combined sessions as well. So it is something that is changing. Uh, Barry Wanson has really, really started that and bringing that to the fore in New South Wales, because here, if you run a caller school, um, for instance, uh, the three that I've, I've done here, Alan Kerr was at every one of those, mainly because he brought his uh, students down. And that's pretty much normal here. The attendance at caller schools, you only get because uh, you don't get new callers unless they're brought by their mentor generally. That's just the way it happens here. Um, so it, it is changing the structure. And what Janet was saying, being fed with a fire hose just doesn't work. The first one I attended here was 47 topics on a one day seminar. It, it, it just, it didn't work. There was a time that several Caller Lab accredited caller coaches ran, tried to run, did run several schools for teaching caller coaches, mm -hmm. taking the next step and trying to teach people teach experienced callers how to teach other callers. I don't know how it went. I don't know. I don't remember speaking to anybody that went through the school. Um, I know the very, 
before they started that, Bill Peters and Jim Mayo ran a school down in Georgia, I believe, um, and invited me down to be a guinea pig, um, guinea pig collar coach to to teach some sessions and then critique me on how well I taught them to their students there. But I don't know how well they carried that beyond that. So Dan, I have a question for you. You had a pretty good topic. You've stirred up a lot of conversation. I would say maybe a third of it was the conversation on the topic you wanted to talk about and the rest has been about caller schools. What's your, what are your observations? Um, so I think that um, maybe the, the answer is unknowable, uh, but I think that we got some really good kind of visions of how how experienced callers think new callers should learn versus some of you newer callers, thankfully helping us out, telling about how you actually do learn. Um, the chat window over here has been blowing by at an alarming speed with some conversations. And I think that perhaps one of the things that would do well uh, just generally is, and I realize that this material is out there a gazillion times, um, but a, uh, I think Mark Hart said it as a, the things that you know we all wish we'd known the first time through caller school, which is probably about five modules, how you can combine four of those together into a singing call figure and a list of simple singing calls. And that is simple to sing singing calls because you know we also all go to, to caller school with our, you know, we're, I'm going to rock the hell out of this incredibly difficult to sing song and then blow it completely. Um, so that as, as something published, but I also think, um, a couple of times here, I've seen, I've heard people talk about, I hope this is going to continue um, or things like that. And I, I know I've beat this drum before, but we are callers. What we do is we organize communities and create communities. And so when you say, I hope this is going to continue, the only reason this is occurring is that I said, I'm going to spend 15 bucks to get a Zoom membership, post something on newbie callers. And Don said, that sounds like a great idea. I'll get, uh, get the topics organized. So if there is something that you as a newer caller want to see, put it up on newbie callers, ask, because there are so many callers who would love to help who are doing this because they some of them are doing this because their egos are completely involved and that's fine you can use that some of them are doing this because they love square dancing or some combination of these things and if you are excited about doing that all that it takes is something like this and 15 bucks to start a, a conversation like this and yeah i just I wanted to reiterate that because I hear it over and over again. I hope this continues. I hope somebody puts together, well, we're callers, we're somebody, we're the ones who put it together. Um, I did think about mentioning earlier, and I should at this point, there are some callers who are doing sessions one-on-one -on -one or multiple group lectures and kind of things and are charging for them. Um, we're doing these for free because we like to, um, but these guys are people who are full, who were before COVID full-time callers and full-time coaches and have the experience and are hurting for income right now. Um, they're just trying to survive. Um, the prices they're charging are very reasonable from what I understand and probably for more than one reason. Um, don't shy away from them because they're not free because you, well, I, I've always said you get what you pay for. I hope you're getting more than you pay for here. You get what, what Dan's paying for and what I am for the mental image stuff. Um, but again, some people like Dan and I have other professions. My current profession is social security. <laughs> I do other things too. Um, but some are, are relying, have been relying for many years on being professional square dance callers 
and are hurting now when when they aren't being hired by places thank goodness because of the the virus going around but don't shy away from it or you know, or, or don't call them selfish just because they are charging for their things because you, you can get some good stuff and it's worth your while so i noticed cc in the chat i don't want to drag the conversations out for forever if again if people feel like they need to learn but cc in the chat mentioned that she's paid for a few one-on-one -on -one sessions cc can you talk to us a little bit about what you got out of that uh what you brought into it how you want to yeah how, how you experience yeah, let me that. leave the room so that you, there's not all the background noise i have lots of kids so um yes <laughs> um i i was able to um the sessions that i participated in um, the caller actually gave me homework, which I love. Um, I've only been calling since 2018. And I started because my club didn't have a teacher and we were starting to um, fail. The club membership was going down. We were the most active club um, on our side of the state. And um, we lost our teacher, hired another one that fell through. And so I was like, well, I'm not going to be a caller, but I can teach the moves because I know how to do that. But um, having the one on one sessions, it, it's like the difference between going to a classroom setting and the difference to having a one on one tutor. So having the one on one sessions, um, you know, he was able to pick my brain and find out where I was and then give me homework to stretch it and and come back with the homework and then do that again and see how much i i actually understood and retained and so that having a one-on-one -on -one mentor is imperative to most things like this that are very complex when you're yes it's easy but it's still complex and it it it's a whole different um way of thinking and you have to learn the language and you have to learn the mechanics, just like if you were to learn a foreign language, you, you, you have to use it. And I was afraid that um, I was going to lose everything with COVID that I had learned. I did go to caller school, um, one caller school. Um, so I taught two sets of lessons. I did accelerated. I used videos to assist me. But um, like Brian, I wasn't a uh, PNT SDF Pacific Northwest Teen Square Dance Festival participant. I didn't start dancing until I had kids and that was 2007 and my kids participated in in the Square Dance Festival up here in the Northwest for five years. So um, starting to call and my whole family dancing and and not wanting to lose it, having a few sessions every now and then to help me retain what I've already learned and also expand my knowledge and abilities was imperative so that when we come back, I'm able to help my dancers be able to have a good time. So that's it. I take that as a high recommendation for one-on-one -on -one coaching online even if you have to pay for it because yes yeah um i i also had a local mentor but he ended up sick with covid actually and so my one-on-one -on -one mentor um hasn't been available and we were meeting about once a month one thing that i would recommend all new callers who are working with an experienced caller is do not hesitate to bring them back down i i tell my mentor i say okay the reins are on, the bridle's in your mouth, I'm reining you back in, I'm not that far yet. Bring it back, bring it back. Don't go that far, I'm not there yet. Come back to my level. That is the you know? hardest thing to teach a new caller is to say, shut up, stop, go back, I don't understand, do it again. Yes, yes. Don't be afraid to say, hey, I'm not getting that, let's go about it a different way. Can you teach it to me a different way? Can we look at it another way? If not, can you show me somebody who could? That, Cece, I think that's probably the best comment. If you can't teach it the way I want to learn, can you tell me somebody who can? That, that's like asking a boss or in the military, sure, can I get, 
can you sign for that, please? Asking for that signature, or asking a recommendation really makes you think about how you're doing things. I love the comment. Excellent. Well, a piece of advice that I once heard, and this is for um, if I were an experienced caller trying to teach someone else, and that is there's no better way to know whether they understood what you said than to have them teach you what you just taught them. Come in. Yeah. I love that. I know in Gerhard was talking uh, earlier about um, quality control and we don't assess our callers. That, that is one thing that they used to do in Europe. Uh, that's what the Caller Lab Accreditation Program does is an assessment program from callers. To, it's more of a quality assurance thing for callers. Uh, it is something that is not done uh, to the extent that it should be. And as, as Don was saying, how we teach and how it's actually done is not regulated. You asked the question earlier about how many of these schools that people were frustrated with were accredited caller schools or with accredited coaches. Um, I can say right off the top of my head, nobody else wanted to say that, but I don't, I'm never politically correct anyway. Uh, a lot of them are. There are some absolutely phenomenal callers out there with extreme amounts of knowledge that quite frankly cannot teach worth a damn. They're fantastic callers, they're wonderful people, and a few of them are my good friends. And they, they openly admit, I can't teach, I don't know how to teach, I don't know, I can share what I know, but help me do this, help me teach this to somebody. There are a lot of caller schools out there that are syllabus oriented. Here's what's on the schedule. There's a lot of presentations that come up, which I call uh, death by PowerPoint or, or pain by PowerPoint, if you will. But they'll put up the slide and they just read the words on the slide, word for word. That's it. That's the whole presentation. Thank you very much. No questions. I'm going home. All the information's there, but understanding it to the audience is not there. And it is a big thing. So new new callers, especially, if you don't understand, please put the hand up. Please raise the hand. And if nobody waves at the hand, yell at us. So on the teaching notion, um, well, I, I have decided that the next caller school I'm going to go to is a traditional square dance caller school. And I just went and looked at the schedule of the 2019 Dare to be Square West uh, um, festival, which has a, a caller track. And they have an hour intro and the rest of the weekend for that room is caller practice, which I think is a very different approach than the way that we do this in uh, Caller Lab. And I'd also, in Mel, in your com comment about um, kind of certifying callers and looking at callers, I I think it's well worth keeping in mind as much as I like the fact that Caller Lab has created the organization or created the the activity that I like more than a traditional square dancing. And I like a lot of the people in square dancing. Caller Lab is exactly the wrong organization to be doing this because Caller Lab has been providing over the presiding over the decline of square dancing for quite a while. So Caller Lab as an institution does not know what makes for successful a successful program or successful dancing. We have to figure that out outside of the structure of that organization. Ooh, there's a topic for a whole month. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Just to I, comment on training for traditional square dance callers, there is much less concern there about the content, about what to call, um, just by the nature of the activity. And I think that, you know, Mark and I have been, Mark Hart and I have been going back and forth in the chat session here while this has been going on. And I think we're of the opinion that it sure would have been nice for the, you know, that the booklet of what you take to caller school to go in with the, with exactly that, a very simple thing, a, you know, four modules and how those modules stack to be a singing call figure. Um, because we put so much effort into learning choreography because that's the kind of people who are drawn to calling. But in fact, if you call it well, 
dancers will dance chicken pluckers all night long and not com for the most part not complaining you know advanced and challenge callers or, or dancers are different but they that the the thing about even my calling or my calling experience was that i went in thinking that choreography was really really important and five six years later i'm now like yeah, whatever. Choreography doesn't matter. What matters is the rhythm of the presentation. Dancers having a good time. It, it, it's an interesting thing that that happens a lot. Um, when we teach new callers, one of the biggest things that happened in the starting, I think, in the late 70s and through the 80s was we lost the plot as callers for teaching callers how to call and this was with the advent of sight calling and the aspect was hi my name is Mel I'm a brand new call okay well I, what, what I want you to do is just get up and move the dancers around on the floor well how do I do that it was left out oh just just get up and move the dancers just call whatever you want just call whatever comes to mind here here's a singing call just call the singing call and as Don was saying there's a lot of callers that get up there there's the material they present they can present it exceptionally well and have no idea what what is actually happening on the floor other than if I start with a static square I end up with a swing your corner and it works and there's a lot of callers that got away with that for a long time then came sight calling and so many callers said well you don't have to learn about formation you don't have to learn about arrangement you don't have to learn about sequence you don't have to learn about this just learn to sight call move the dancers around okay now you need to learn a resolution technique and you, you lose and oh you're a caller and all that stuff was left behind um, and one of the comments that was made in the chat room was um, friends and enemies. I thought they were talking about the two-place line resolution technique because there was a couple of side chats going on. And no, he was talking about terminology is our friend or enemy uh, because we, we've used, even in this session, zero line, partner line, uh, 1P, 2P, corner box, zero box, zero module, and a zero setup, meaning boy on the left, girl on the right. Well, forgot box one four. I'm not. We, we nobody actually said box one four tonight. <laughs> you know, it was, it was just it was just those things. And uh, I think it was you, Janet, that said when we do things like that, new callers don't. For some reason, they're afraid to say stop. You get to that point of chicken plucker, and if you don't know what a chicken plucker is, that's where you stop because your focus is trying to focus on the chicken plucker. The caller's still going down that road. And he's now moved on to modules and magic modules and, and site resolution. You're still thinking, what the hell's a chicken plucker? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. By the time you figure it out, you know, the weekend's gone. You've already done your session. And you're, ah, now I understand chicken. Okay, what's the next time? Oh, everybody's gone. And that's the way we teach. The last thing I want to say is, Dan, uh, I don't think Color Lab is the wrong organization to preside over square dancing. I think they're an excellent organization for square dancing. But they are not... They're not what makes square dancing square dancing. They're not what has caused the decline of square dancing. In fact, if anything, there's what they are what has ha actually held square dancing together through this decline. What's caused the decline of square dancing is us as callers not doing what we should be doing and calling for our own egos, rushing the dancers through the levels and forgetting that it's about the dancers. It's not about us callers. But that's a personal thing. That's a discussion for another time. Uh, Steve, you had your hand up. Yeah, I, I kind of want to say exactly almost what you just said. You know, when I first learned how to call, what was told to me is exactly you get the dancers mixed up, get two pairs together, get them in a line, then do it, get a pass through, wheel and deal. If the paired couples are in the middle, hit zoom, and then the new centers get them to the corners. That's all I did, and that's all I knew for the longest time is how to resolve. It wasn't until just recently I learned about modules and other stuff. You, you know, and I can't thank you guys, thank you, Mel and uh, Don and Dan and these other experienced callers I've come in to chime in and stuff. I've learned a ton of stuff since then. We, uh, I, when I was getting into calling, I was amazed and surprised and very pleased 
that many, many callers wanted to share their experience rather than compete with the other caller. There, there's still this bit of competition. I want these dancers to come to my dance and not yours, but um, there was a lot of sharing. And that, I think that is the, for a couple of reasons. One, this is my hobby, even if it's my business also. It's my hobby and I like to talk to people of, that, that have a similar hobby. And two is I think we know that if we don't perpetuate the skill of calling, we're not going to have good dancers out there that will appreciate coming to my dances or, or what have you. So it, it is a very sharing community and, and um, this is one way we're able to do it. And, and I'm glad some people are enjoying it. Um, those that are able to read the chat room at the same time as, as watching the conversation. Um, I'm not one of them, so I record it and read it later, but I just put something in there. For those of you that are, are caller coaches and, or anybody that does any kind of presentations at all, there's an, and we've mentioned this before, especially I think during Clark Baker's session, there's what I think is an amazing hour and three minute talk on YouTube given by an MIT, I think he's a math professor, um, speaking about how to give a talk. And at first I thought he wasn't very interesting because he's not very dynamic in his speaking, but his points are so great that he gives it. And he generally will introduce a new topic and then say, see, I got your interest because I just did this. Um, things what to do. Somebody was just reading, talking about putting up a PowerPoint thing and just reading the lines of it. And, and oh, you're this, talking about my uh, my former boss, uh, the late uh, uh, Patrick Winston out of the MIT AI lab. And uh, if you look on YouTube, I, posted, uh, I, I, posted, I think the name of the thing is how to speak. Yes, I posted the link in the chat, Chris. I think you posted it privately, Don. I just put it up there in, in the public chat. Oh, really? I didn't realize that. As I say, I don't do chat very well. It's an uh, excellent presentation. You are absolutely right. It, it's, a, it's a great, and, and many people I've mentioned this to have um, said, oh, that's interesting. And then there are others like Chris and, and Clark Baker who said, oh, yeah, I've been to one of those. It was great. So <laughs> I guess he does this in midterm every year, gives a lecture once, and one of them got recorded. Um, it's entertaining in itself and, and the points he, pro he, he, he presents, um, but definitely get past the first two or three minutes because he, he starts out slowly. Chris, did you go to one of his, his um, presentations or just have him um, as an instructor in the AI lab? You're muted, Chris. I, say, I, I actually didn't go to them uh, uh, when I was there. Uh, uh, I, I just worked for him, <laughs> but uh, uh, but I, but it was well known uh, that they were uh, really good talks. And uh, um, the uh, so in, yeah, in, in uh, very much uh, latter days, uh, they they managed to uh, uh, tape one of them. Is he no longer there? Uh, he yeah, he passed away uh, not that long ago. Oh, that's, that's sad. Yeah. Boy, I did a good job of changing the subject. Didn't mean to. <laughs> I, well, I didn't mean to totally make the other subject go away. Yeah. I keep thinking I've been sitting here for two and a half hours. I should really go on and continue with my day. But you guys are having an interesting conversation. I don't want to miss any of it. <laughs> There's another one on that topic, which is, it's about academic presentations, but it goes on with that. That's Jonathan Schuix. Uh, he was a professor at Berkeley, but it was on, again, how to give that presentation. And I'm really glad you brought that up, Don, because it's one of those things we as callers, when we teach callers, that is exactly what we are doing is we are not, it's, although it's an informal setting, it is a formal presentation. It's an academic talk, it's an academic lecture, and it's an academic interactive process of learning because it is a very technical thing that we are actually trying to impart. 
and doing it properly and following those steps is something that really, really needs to be taught to callers and caller mentors. I'm really glad you brought it. That's a, I forgot all about that, but that's an excellent video. Have you had a chance to watch it now? Oh yeah, I've watched it a number of times. I, I, I do a lot of teach. I did a lot of teaching in the military and I did a lot of teaching with here. Um, it's the same thing with presentations. When I was doing my uh, ranger training here, uh, I was doing it through Teach Me Law Enforcement and they called me up about the next class. And I'm going, well, I haven't finished this one. I said, no, we want you to come and teach on it. I hadn't even been marked on the one I was doing yet. It's just that is that. And a lot of the lessons that he gives are basic common sense about teaching and presenting. It, it's well worth it for anybody that has any kind of academic presentation process, regardless of the topic, it can cross over. Now, the other one that you mentioned, is that on YouTube? And if so, no, it's, it's actually a word session. Uh, um, Jonathan Shuick has some videos. I, I ha haven't actually watched his videos, but he's got some very good writings. But that particular post is just a, a post which runs through the basic prelims of giving an academic session things to avoid. We talk about PowerPoint, we talk about things, various things, you know, and when you, when you give a presentation, such as a PowerPoint presentation, if you, if you have a PowerPoint presentation, it goes up on the screen and what you're, what you've got up on the screen is everything that you're going to read verbatim. The person in the audience has to choose what it is they want to miss rather than what they want to understand. And that's, that's really the premise that they go through it is, is stop making the students choosing what not to learn, give them what they want, focus them on an idea, and then let them learn and listen to you with the ideas focused. So it's, it's those kinds of things, and they're excellent, excellent, excellent presentations. Um, the one I mentioned, as I say, hang in there for the first few minutes because it doesn't sound that interesting until he really gets into it. I was just playing it back in my mind and watch the audience. He's got a full lecture hall full of people. They're kind of sitting there almost blank eyed. But as the time goes by, they're catching on to his style and what he's telling you. And they get more and more involved also, or at least react with, with little chuckles and, and that kind of thing. It's, it's interesting. To watch. Another one, I cannot remember the fellow's name right now, but he was an old baseball coach. And he got up to give a speech to, uh, well, he's done it many, many times, but to international and national baseball coaches, stars, players, and everything else. And he was well in his 80s, and he got up to give this presentation, and he's got a baseball home plate around his neck. And he went through the whole presentation with this, and, that, you know, and everybody started chuckling. It was a good presentation. And at the end, he says, now you're probably wondering why I'm doing this. And it was all about coaching and people learning. And he says, in the major leagues, what's the size of home plate? And he said, well, 17 inches. And what? Okay. And then you go all the way down the list. At junior, at, at the peewees, at t-ball, what's the size of home plate? It's 17 inches. And it was all about, well, we don't change the size of home plate to adapt to this person or that person. Oh, you threw the ball, you couldn't get it over home plate. We'll make home plate bigger so you can do that. That isn't done in baseball. You know, and he went through this whole session about you have to coach people to learn how to fail in order to teach them how to succeed. You have to teach them how to want to get better to achieve that goal rather than cater down or dumb it down or get there first. And it was those kinds of teaching sessions and this one that you're talking about are absolutely paramount in learning how to teach and how to reach people out and reach into people to get them motivated. So I'm really glad you brought that up. We really got off the track, didn't we, Dan? <laughs> so, so going back to mentorship. And so like when I was in university, um, the way I, 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 I'm a multi-sensory learner. So the way that I figured out who my instructors were gonna be is I would ask around or I would sign up for a wide variety of courses and check out the instructors in their style. And, um, and then I would go for the one that fit me the best, right? I mean, there, you have to have a good connection. And I, um, I work in the school district as well um, with, the, with the younger kids uh, up. And I found that some of the kids were getting behind and so some of the ideas that I had of how to teach them 
was not allowed in school. So I started helping some of the kids after school in my own home. And it sort of snowballed, right? Because my, my way of, I just got creative and made games and whatever. So, but you have to find the right way to make somebody learn. And then you have the fun of having that light bulb go on, you know, and that body language changes. I get that self-confidence. I had, I had students that I, I can remember one student coming in. It was the middle of summer. It was like 30 degrees and she was layered in clothes and her eyes were downcast and she basically given up. And by the end of the summer, not only did she understand some of the things that she'd be missing, she was coming in tank tops and was having quite a, I, you know, and, and her parents says, we love this, but this is going a little overboard, right? Like, you know, her personality change and stuff. And I thought, I'm able to pass on the fact that I have a different learning style and help other people. And so my hope is that eventually if I can actually click onto this Gawler stuff, that I can help some of the, the dancers and maybe down the road, way down the road if we have stuff like this, help mentor some of the new callers so they don't have to go through what I went through. I mean, it, it, there's got to be a way of not having people quit because they can't learn it the right way, right? So, so the mentorship is, how do you get a mentor? Because a couple of you guys have, you know, I've said so. But how do I find a mentor that works with, that functions well with me without hurting other people's feelings when it doesn't, doesn't work? So what I do is I'm procrastinating, <laughs> you know, because it's like, okay, um, because I may need more than one mentor. It may take a village for me to learn how to go <laughs> and, and just find the specialties of certain people can break this down for me and another person can break that down for me. I think I just gave myself the right, my own answer, right? <laughs> Sorry. Uh, yeah, I think pursue, pursue mentorship with, with as many people as you can, as you've got energy to, to work with and the ones that don't work will just fall by the wayside. Um, Daryl Clendenin volunteered to be available for anything anybody asks about. Um, I'm pretty much that way. Yolanda, you can send me questions, and if it's something I think I can help you on, I'd be more than willing to. And if it's something I think I'm just going to parrot what everybody else says, um, maybe I'll translate it for you. But um, I, I, I just have to have the guts to make the first steps. That's all. Well, as you a know. teacher... As a teacher, yeah. I loved what, what you said. One of the biggest rewards of teaching people is seeing that light bulb come on. That I, I love that comment because I've thought it many times while teaching different things. And sure. the other thing is, the other advantage to reaching out on mentorship is I think one of the, the strong lessons of this session has been <clears throat> that even people in the same space and same stage of learning with you can be extremely powerful, if not more powerful than the master mentor. Yeah. yeah. Um, so build those communities too. Which was part of your main premise of this whole presentation, Dan. Yes. Exactly. Yes, because yes, during university times, I think I learned just as much. There, I would, I would arrange to sit on one of the largest tables in the lunchroom and invite as many people to come and have lunch together and we would figure things out. I gave quite a few hints on how to get around certain instructors, by the way. <laughs> Definitely sometimes it's easier to understand people that are speaking the same language you are. Yeah. Yeah. That is so true. I think with that, guys, I'm gonna bow out can't believe how long these sessions go, but enjoying it. Yeah. One of the biggest comments that comes out, Don, is the sessions where there's an interactivity, not only during the presentation, but room for discussion. 
and then diversity discussion afterwards, that's where most people are getting the most benefit. The, like the class presentations are really, really well done. They're really well received and attended, but that's one of the biggest complaints about them is there's no room for discussion. When it's over, end of topic, go home, it's shut off. Yeah. These things can sometimes last for hours. And then sometimes Dan, by the way, congratulations. Uh, Dan often leaves the room open and goes away and it's just a new new caller discussion forum, a place where new callers can get together to do that. I did that with mine last weekend as well. And it, you know, they were still going there three, four hours after the session, just having a chat between new callers. One of the things that Dan and I discussed way back when, when we found out the COVID class thing was also happening, was that maybe we'd let them give a present, it's back when they were doing it in, at noon Eastern time and we were doing it two hours later, maybe we'd let them do a presentation and then we'd just have a discussion on their presentation. Um, the main reason we decided against that was that would make, make a requisite to ours having listened to their presentation. Yeah. And that wasn't practical. Um, I still, I keep thinking I'm going to go back and listen to the recordings because I don't get a chance to listen live. And I think I've listened to four or five. I haven't gotten to many of them yet, but. Well, a lot, a lot yeah. of their presentation, although they do have a lot of detailed other presentations on the technical aspects and the um, equipment, pretty much between yours, mine, and a couple of the other ones that are on there, that is what happened. All those topics have been cut down. Uh, one of their presentations was actually on modules, but that was five pre presentation over five hours and, and eight hours of discussion afterwards um, to deal with it at that level, bring it down. And it was very much like Daryl said, here's the syllabus, here's all the material. Now let's take it piece by piece. It's like a university textbook. It's laid out with a table of contents. You learn part one before you go to part two, before you go to part three, but you got to learn each part first rather than here's everything at once. So that's what we're doing. That's what you guys are doing. And sounds like very clever that you've broken the subject of modules down into little modules. Uh, I broke it down into five, I'm sorry, six sessions uh, on modules. And as I said, in each session, that's just how to use them progressively. But that's why all the material, the written material is given them because we have only just barely scratched the surface. And that was what uh, videos was six 40 minute presentations or sometimes a one hour presentation, usually with about two hours of talk afterwards. So that's what 18 hours on modules and we have just barely scratched the surface of understanding modules. Yeah, and, and I'm doing the same thing that Carol's doing and going back to the first one mm -hmm. and start because as you're going along, some of this stuff actually starts making more sense and then you go back and review. Yeah. And uh, yeah. And I and thought I understood modules. Now I realize from all the time you put into it that I probably don't. Well, it's like what, what you were saying there, Dan, of, you know, a session about learn four modules and how to structure those into a singing call. Well, that is actually part of using modules as a singing call and focus modules and the whole thing. But you got to sit through the four, first four hours of those classes and, and the discussions afterwards to get to that point of how to use those five or four of the five foundation modules to make your singing call. So it is there, but it's like, like I love what you said about the caller that called right and left or oh, stop, go home. I don't, and that's not what I meant. Did not understand what it was he was doing. That caller could have got up there and presented a phenomenal singing call and nobody would have known that that caller did not know what he was doing. And you caught that when all of the coaches missed that. And that's what's missing in caller coaching and mentoring is saying, okay, excellent job on this. This part needs a little work. Let's see how we can make that. How, how can we make your strengths stronger? And let's put that weakness aside until we're ready to tackle it. I, I've probably mentioned this before, but one of the things I enjoy most about doing caller schools or seminars, um, you know, several session center marks seminars um is the critiquing of callers when they're when they're calling and one of the reasons i like it is my presentation on this or on that or what have you is prepared and frequently parroted from many times i've done it before 
but I like the challenge of having somebody get up there and I have no idea what he's going to do, what he's going to do right and what he's going to do wrong. And for me to be able to see the several things that he could improve on, pick out the one that we can most easily get him to grasp, to help him improve and see a change. Um, and the one that will make the biggest difference for him and then be able to explain to him in a very short time how to improve that weakest point he has and then get him to perform again um, so he can feel and see the difference. That's the part I enjoy because I can't prepare for that. And right. it's pride in being able to, to jump in and grasp that. But it's also the kind of thing that, oh my God, I hope I find something this time. <laughs> I ran a color school in Ottawa over 10 weekends and uh, when I, a couple of the color, phenomenal callers and most of them, well, two of them in particular now call much higher levels than I do and they're still calling, which is absolutely fantastic. But uh, he was actually talking to me the other day and he said, I always remember the one lesson that you gave me from color school. And I was trying to figure out what lesson that it was. And he says, oh, it was the one on showmanship. And I'd done a lot of those. And I says, well, what was it? He says, well, it was after I'd finished calling and he said, I've got something that'll really improve your calling. And he went out to the kitchen and he got two of those big tomato cans and I put them on his feet to make him stop dancing and hopping and skipping around the stage because that's how he was keeping time. And it was so distracting to the dancers. They were watching him dance, trying to dance the square dance. He was dancing like a round dance cure accused, which is very awkward to do when you're square dancing. And he says, I'll always remember that. That was the greatest lesson you ever gave me. And I, I thought, okay, I talked about this. I talked about modules. I talked about choreography. I talked about resolution. I talked about presentation. And the greatest lesson I gave you was putting tomato cans on your feet. <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you never know what's going to strike. So, I'm Well, and feedback to me was, I mean, that's, that's one of the things I went to college school for was to get feedback on what I could improve. How can I do things differently? That kind of thing. And at some of the schools, I had to go search out the feedback. I had to ask for the feedback. It was not readily given, which was extremely disappointing. Well, you know, Janet, one of the things, well, a couple things. One is when I do a caller school, it's really a torn between two things. Callers are anxious to get mic time and you know you'll notice most of the caller schools say and we'll give you plenty of mic time because they know that's what the dancers want the callers want the caller students um to find the time to give mic time and also to present the information that you want to present and it's it's a balance between those um and when you then when you get to critiquing somebody's calling um as I said, I try to find, I, I see possibly lots and lots of things that maybe they didn't do correctly, but I try to find the one thing um, and give them feedback on that one thing that would be the easiest for them to correct, correct and make or, and or make the biggest difference in their presentation. And maybe once they've gotten that, the next time I'll try to, to find the next weaker point. But it's hard to give feedback on everything because that's, again, the fire hose. It's, it's one of the things that comes up an awful lot is when we give constructive criticism, one of the things that a lot of mentors, teachers, even school teachers, they focus on the last word instead of the first word. And it's just criticism. It, it's very easy to find out what's wrong. It's very difficult to figure out what's right and how to improve on it to help you get past what's wrong. Uh, I've, I've noticed that a lot, like I do these um, newbie caller exercises and some of the responses I have to actually go to email because it's just too big to post on Facebook. But some of the new callers that have material that they're doing, if they're putting a module together or doing a focus module or trying to do invert and rotate modules, which was the last exercise, they come up with some absolutely phenomenal choreography and phenomenal ideas trying to work this out and it surprised me that said um, 
you know, they've worked with other people. Nobody's ever told me that I was doing that part right. It's always, what are you doing wrong? And that's something that we've got to change in our teaching methodology. I've mentioned this before that, that one of the things my mentor, Jim Mayo, told me, when you go to a dance, it's easy to pick out what the things out the caller's doing wrong, but those aren't the ones you want to emulate. Try and figure out what he's doing right and learn from those. Yeah. One of the yes. things I find I do poorly is learn how to get out of a one-hour meeting after one hour. It's been three hours, guys. I really got to go. <laughs> <laughs> It's Bye. Been, see ya. Bye. Thank you for a great Bye. session. I probably need to get going too, so I will talk to you guys later. All right. And yeah, I'm going to, uh, I will leave the chat room open, obviously. And it's going to be a little bit longer before I post the video today because after I close things down, I'm going to have to splice two videos together because I stopped and started accidentally. But um, I will, ca I will, will uh, take myself virtually out even as I physically remain here and let you all continue if anybody wants to continue. No worries. I'll stick around if anybody wants to talk about anything. If not, I'll probably head out because I got another session coming up in mm -hmm. five hours. I, I did um, email you, Mel, a week or two ago about um, learning. You had, with your presentations, you were, um, you had the uh, red lettering so you could put it on Tamination and get it to play and I, I didn't quite understand how to do that so I emailed you. Did you get that? I'm just looking. I don't think I even got an email from you. Which it doesn't mean that you actually got it because I've had troubles with the computer. I'm just just searching right now. Hmm. I don't think I got it, Yolanda. Okay, that that's on my side of the coin then, because uh, I'm still figuring. We I've had multiple sessions with my internet provider trying to figure things out. We've got a we've got a different speed and all that kind of stuff going on now. So, um, so somewhere along the line, some of my emails didn't actually make it through. That's why I asked. So I will email you again. At the last, the last email.